So let's go ahead and give it another two minutes to let you go through that and then we'll uh, we'll kick it off shortly. All right, great. Who else has hopped on? Can you do a sound check, please? Hi, Angela, could you do a sound check, please? I think we've got a few people who have logged on and run away for a moment. Hey, Alan, I'm going to do a quick sound check. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I heard myself, though. I'm not sure why if it came through from your speaker or something. So just make sure you're um, only have one um, audio connection with us. All right, Wes and Eric, I think we're doing pretty good. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for being here today uh, to another uh, exciting meeting of the Florida's Coral Reef Coordination Team. I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order um, and remind everyone that the meeting is being recorded and being webcast live. Um, there will be opportunity for public comment at the end of the meeting, and we look forward to that for sure. Um, I think we're just gonna gonna get ready to roll through. I hope everybody's worked off their uh, their Thanksgiving dinners by this point. Um, pretty crazy to think that only two weeks ago we had a South Florida Ecosystem Restoration Task Force meeting in Washington D.C. It feels like months have gone by since then, um, and we're gonna quickly turn around into the uh, holiday season here in December. So it's great to fit this one in um, and uh, kind of look towards next year. Um, at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to our vice chair, Eric, uh, for any remarks he'd like to give. Sure thing, glad to, glad to be here. Glad to have everyone here together again. Um, for me, I kind of wanted to take a moment to frame up what we're doing here today. So I'll, I'll take a moment to just say thank you, everybody, on helping us with the monitoring framework for Florida Coral Reef, getting that done, getting us approved and signed off and getting it in time for the task force meeting was really, uh, you know, put us right on track. I really appreciate it. Of course, that's first step. We prioritize, we set up the actions, and now we have to get to work. So that's uh, really what this is going to be about. Um, the other uh, interesting thing that I think going on today is that um, we tend to fall into the minutia as a group of scientists and start working on the issues or the the challenges of the day as we we um, get something like a monitoring framework in hand. We're like, okay, now we're going to run with this. But in here, there is a a significant part of that pointed at conceptual ecological models, hypothesis clusters, performance monitoring, performance tracking, and those type of analytical tools. And so a good portion of what we're doing here today is going to be hearing from some people that are real experts on how they've gone about doing that. And I encourage the team here to kind of keep our vision a little further downfield than on the uh, the burning issue of the day and think about how we want to approach these overall larger questions of how we establish this appropriate monitoring framework and actually make it something implementable that we can actually work and coordinate well with re with the restoration and loan recovery processes. Um, so I think that that's really a critical piece of it. Um, I really just appreciate being able to work together with the group. I look forward to us meeting together in person when the time comes soon. Uh, and, and, and thank you. So back to you, Wes. Thank you so much, Eric. I would second everything that you said, and thank you for your leadership uh, through this process as well. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Alan to just go over, uh, you know, simple meeting procedures and give everybody expectations for how this will go. 
Sure. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, I do have a presentation that just goes over a few points. And while we're waiting for that to come up, um, just wanted to start uh, as a reminder, this body reports back to the working group and the science coordination group. And as Eric mentioned, even the task force and or was it West saying that we bring this information forward to all our other um, bodies of, of folks. So thank you very much because this information is being shared within your um, associates and other agencies as well. Um, we report back to the task force at meetings and also this coming year is a reporting year. It's 2024, we will be issuing a biennial report this year. So we'll have some information about our team in that document that goes to Congress um, at the, by the end of this year. Now um, I will walk you through some steps for participating on the Zoom um, feature. Next slide, please, Marsha. Thank you again. Um, Wes already said that we are also live casting this. So if you have um, any issues with Zoom, you can also log in um, and watch on the YouTube channel um, for our live webcast. And please note that uh, attendees are automatically muted in our listen only mode. And um, that please refrain from raising your hands until we get to the public comments um, portion of the day for the members of the public who are attending. And you'll be able to use that, um, the raise hand feature for the public comment section. Uh, Marsha, next slide. Yep, just use the raise hand feature. And once we see you're there, we're gonna be calling on everyone one by one and unmuting your microphones. Next page, next slide. And then depending on the time we will um, of the meeting and how long we have left for our day, we will might have a time of two or three minutes for your comments and just please keep your comments to whatever time is um, dictated by the chairs at that time. Next slide. And everything is posted on evergladesrestoration.gov. There is currently a link on the homepage that will take you to all the meeting information. Following this meeting, we'll get a summary as well as the um, recording of this video will also be loaded up there. And if you wanna be informed of any of our other groups and meetings, please sign up for um, notices at the subscribe here page that you'll see at the bottom of every page of our website. And that is all I have. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Marsha. Uh, we're just going to kick right into uh, going around the screen and uh, trying to get everybody's comments. So uh, I am concerned that I might not be able to see everybody. So I'm just going to call down the list um, for for the folks uh, who are not here. That's fine. We'll give them a couple seconds and then we'll, we'll move on to the next name on the list. Um, so first on my list, um, I have Chris Eggleston from the Florida Keys National Wildlife Refuge Complex. Uh, yeah, hey, good afternoon, folks. Um, I'm here. It's all yours, Chris. Oh, um, <clears throat> if yeah, you'd like sorry. to say anything. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, no, I, I uh, apologize for that. I appreciate uh, being a part of the team and, and uh, being on this. I hope to, uh, you know, be sort of a conduit um for some to bring some of the issues that we're discussing here to other experts in the u.s fish and wildlife service and uh, maybe i can bring some something to the table uh by using the rest of my fish and wildlife service team thank you very much chris sarah i know you're you're with us over the phone are you in a position where you can say a couple words i am Good, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Sarah Fangman, Superintendent, Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. And uh, our role in Florida's coral reef is to co-manage along with the state of Florida, the waters around the Florida Keys and uh, surrounding the Tortugas National Park. And so I look forward to today's meeting and appreciate working with you all. Thank you, Wes. My pleasure. And thank you for uh, holding down the fort down there, Sarah. Uh, very challenging year. Um, can we go to Wade Lehman from US EPA? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Wade Lehman, EPA Region 4, that's the Southeast region. I manage our ocean and coastal programs, which includes the National Estuary Program, our South Florida Geographic Program, and our ports programs as well. Um, as far as it goes for this meeting, I look forward to seeing what we have to present. And uh, just a quick update, 
we have through our South Florida program, a grants issuing uh, process. And this year we're putting out about $10 million in grants that are applicable across all of South Florida. Uh, and we're in the process of notifying the awardees right now. Um, so there are many of them that are pertinent to this group. That's it for me. Great. Thanks, Wade. And maybe you can share that uh, that final list with the group uh, when it when it comes available. Absolutely. Uh, It'll probably be January timeframe. No problem. Thank you. We appreciate that. Um, as a reminder, if, if there are ever any awards or, or funding that's going out um, for reef related projects, this is a great venue uh, to, to share that information. Um, or if there are, um, you know, future grant opportunities, we definitely want that information getting out um, to our to our um, our agencies and our, our local government partners as well. Uh, we're going to move on to Gil McRae from FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. Gil, are you on? I am. Good afternoon, everybody. So I am the, the director of FWC's Fish and Wildlife Research Institute. We maintain a pretty substantial coral reef monitoring and research program that is responsible for one of the longest running time series of coral reef uh, cover and condition anywhere in the world. Unfortunately, the last few years have seen us record a increasingly uh, declining level of coral cover throughout much of the reef uh, for various reasons, SCTLD and others. Um, we have, along with our state partners, DEP, uh, started implementing a significant coral reef resilience and restoration action, uh, which you will hear more about. The uh, components of that are diverse and complicated, but essentially we have a large number of rescue corals that we have taken off the reef. They're currently in uh, aquaria in Florida and elsewhere. Those corals will ultimately be brought back and used to propagate corals for restoration purposes. Uh, and we're attempting to integrate as closely as possible with NOAA's mission iconic reefs and other efforts. So very excited about this group and uh, its uh, involvement in the task force. And I'm also a member of the science coordination group for the uh, South Florida Ecosystem Task Force. So it's been a long time coming. Happy to see this group up and running. Thank you. Thanks, Gil, so much for all your, your great work. Next on my list is Nikki Morgan with DEP. Hey, Liz. Uh, so Nikki Morgan with the Department of Environmental Assessment and Restoration within DEP. Um, we focus mostly on surface water and groundwater freshwater uh, resources, but um, you know, as those flow off into the coral reef, hopefully we can get some of that nutrient pollution cleaned up. Um, for updates for us within the Water Quality Restoration Program, colloquially known as BMAP program, uh, we uh, are in our project collection period for any projects completed in 2023. So hopefully we'll have updated uh, Water Quality Restoration program projects uh, available for any of these conceptual ecological models that are being um, produced. Thank you, Nikki. CJ Sweetman, also with FWC. Hi, everyone. Uh, CJ Sweetman with uh, FWC's Division of Marine Fisheries Management. Uh, my position, I'm the, I am the Federal Fisheries Section Leader. And basically, what that constitutes is I oversee and coordinate a wide variety of issues for FWC that's related to the federal management of marine resources, such as federal fisheries management. I myself sit on the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council, uh, help out with the South Atlantic Fishery Management Council, NOAA's Highly Migratory Species, and the International Commission for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. So I'm kind of all over the place there, but I also help coordinate uh, coral management as well, uh, agency commenting, help coordinate. I'm located in the Florida Keys, so I work very closely with Sarah and other folks with the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Um, <clears throat> just want to say, you know, updates from the last time we all saw each other. I thought the field trip that we had to the Deering Estate was pretty remarkable. You know, from my perspective, I'm usually 
sitting behind a computer and analyzing data or providing management recommendations one way or the other. So to get out in the field and to see the actual directed impacts of what these restoration projects are currently accomplishing was was pretty amazing to me, you know, and it kind of sets a high bar for for what we need to do to move forward. I think we certainly have some challenges in front of us, you know, I think uh, getting that water quality impacts into the near shore environment and measuring that is one thing and going out to the coral reef is a completely different other thing. So kind of speaking to some of Eric's comments earlier, obviously I'm kind of at the uh, upper end or higher uh, back end of um, resource management in terms of looking at higher trophic levels. So very interested in uh, how we move this forward and uh, figuring out best steps here. So appreciate it. Looking forward to the discussion today. Thanks, CJ. Uh, we'll turn to Joanna Walzak, DEP's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I am the administrator of our Coral Protection Restoration Program, and I'm also the state's point of contact for all issues associated with Florida's coral reef. A uh, quick couple of quick updates for you from our side of the house. Uh, we, uh, as many of you know, are co-leading with FWC and the uh, Office of Resilience for the state uh, under Wes. Uh, the Governor's Initiative, Florida's Coral Reef Restoration and Recovery Initiative, or CR3 for short. Uh, associated with that initiative, this first year of it is a $9.5 $9 million new award uh, through grants uh, that we received over $13 million in proposals for. So we are in the process of, re of uh, reviewing and recommending to our leadership uh, which awards will be selected for that. And uh, we'll be happy to share that as soon as we hear back from our leadership. We also have a $20 million grant that's associated with water quality uh, in Biscayne Bay, specifically for projects that uh, reduce nutrient pollution to the bay in, in particular. And we will also share that as soon as it's available. I've also just come back a couple of weeks ago from the US Coral Reef Task Force meeting. That's the uh, group of federal agencies and jurisdictional points of contact, including myself, for each of the seven US jurisdictions uh, in the US that have coral. And uh, we passed multiple resolutions uh, there, uh, working on some of that national coral reef policy, a couple of which I think are rele relevant for this group, including uh, the identification of coral reefs as national natural infrastructure. This is getting to the value of our coral reef ecosystem in protecting our shoreline and all of the people, property, and economic activity that, assist that associates uh, in that coastal community. We also passed a resolution related to um, needing more support uh, for stony coral tissue loss disease and other disease and emergency disturbance response events, uh, both here in the Atlantic Caribbean basin, but also in preparation uh, for, heaven forbid, uh, the spread of this disease out into the Pacific. The final resolution was related to watershed initiatives. Uh, the task force knows that watershed initiatives are an important part of coral reef management and uh, here in Florida, we've identified the government cut uh, watershed as our priority in, uh, inlet contributing area, as we call it. So I'm happy to share that information uh, with the group as part of the notes. And that's all I have for DEP today. Thank you, Joanna. I know I, for one, am really excited to uh, hear the news of those uh, FCR3 initiative grants going out soon. Uh, finally, from our voting membership, Dana Wusinich Mendez from NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Thanks, Wes. Hi, everybody. Um, Dana Wusinich Mendez representing NOAA alongside Sarah and Ian Enox at AOML, who could not be here today. Um, NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program um, works to both conduct science and support science, uh, both within NOAA and outside of NOAA, to answer key questions related to the conservation of coral reef ecosystems um, and support threat reduction and restoration efforts on the ground in the seven U.S. coral jurisdictions um, that have um, significant coral reef resources. So I'm our program's management liaison for Florida and our team lead for the Atlantic region. Um, and we are, you know, happy to be at the table with this group and, and in this process to think about how to pull together all of the, 
the puzzle pieces that will help us make more informed decisions and, and take action to um, better direct and inform coral reef um, management decision making in Florida. Great. Thank you so much, Dana. Um, and just a quick question. I think I saw a notice go out um, from NOAA um, soliciting institutions for the Coral Reef Research Centers. Um, mm -hmm, that closed. Um, that okay. closed back in early that, Okay, November, so it was closing, not opening. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, but we did receive applications um, from organizations that would like to be considered as coral reef research centers across um, all seven U.S. coral jurisdictions. So we definitely got applications from Florida, multiple, um, and those are under review right now. And when um, the, the research centers are announced, those research centers will then be eligible to um, apply to become a regional coordinating institute, um, as well as to participate in um, stewardship partnerships that will be associated with specific uh, coral reef areas. Great. Well, we look forward to uh, hearing those announcements and those designations as they come through. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Uh, going to the rest of our membership, I know that Cassandra Armstrong is not able to be here with us today, but I think Derek Cox from South Florida Water Management District is sitting in as her alternate. Yep. Hey, Derek Cox here with South Florida Water Management District. Uh, like Wes said, sitting in for Cassandra Armstrong, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Um, as most of y'all know, the district is heavily involved in Everglades restoration, both from structural and, and a, a monitoring aspect. And so I'm uh, really happy to be here today to participate in this discussion with y'all um, and taking a little bit broader look beyond kind of our typical boundaries that we operate within and looking at a, you know more of the whole picture here. So happy to be here. Thank you, Derek. Uh, moving on to some of our county partners, Angela Delaney with Broward. Hi, everyone. It's Angela Delaney representing Broward County. Um, I manage the Marine Resources Program here at the county. Um, our program, as it relates to the Florida's Coral Reef, um, we have regional partnerships uh, with state and local agencies um, in water quality sampling, disturbance response monitoring, um, coral fate tracking, um, and included in our programs themselves, we have the Artificial Reef Program and our Mooring Buoy Program, which alleviates that pressure on the natural reef offshore here of Broward County um, in, in our way of managing and hopefully doing some conservation work um, with the reef system. So happy to be here. Great. Thank you, Angela. Deb Drum with Palm Beach. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much for including us in this great forum. Um, I am the Director of Environmental Resources Management here in Palm Beach County, and we're always big proponents for improved water quality from land-based sources of pollution that impact coral reefs. Um, we also like to see a good balance between planning studies and near-term actions that can be taken in support of reefs. Um, Palm Beach County reefs actually fared relatively well through the 2023 bleaching event, likely because of our latitude and because the water depths where our most consistent and impressive reefs are um, just, they're a little bit deeper. And so upwellings in July and August also helped cool things off for us up this way. Um, and I just, um, I'm really glad that we are continuing to meet and start keep um, getting some funding focused and, and focusing all of our efforts um, on this very important topic. So thank you. Happy holidays, everybody. Thanks, Deb. Same to you. Laura Eldridge with Miami-Dade. Yeah, thanks, Wes. Um, so Laura Eldridge, I'm Restoration and Enhancement Section Manager at Miami-Dade County's Derm. Uh, and so that's really handling anything, as we like to call it, in, under, over, or adjacent to surface waters within the county. Um, and so all monitoring of natural resources within those areas. Um, we're very excited to announce that we got a new boat in. Um, uh, many of y'all can understand how long and, and how hard and arduous that can take. It took us three years with the global supply 
uh, trade issues. So we're really excited about what that really means to better serve the county in fulfilling its role you know, for reef um, in, in the future water quality monitoring um, offshore and near shore. Uh, we've been continuing to assist uh, SEFCRI in our role as team member and is required by that charter to assist with their outreach efforts. Um, and then as Joanna briefly mentioned, we're also assisting with our, the Government Cut Watershed Management Plan consulting team, and we're working with them and DEP and NOAA for the site visits next week. So they can view the determined sub-watershed, which is the Little River watershed, and move forward with the plan that will connect upstream or upland restoration to provide water quality improvements to affect our offshore coral health through discharges out the inland contributing area. So that's it for us. Thanks, Laura. And I think the question on everybody's mind is how many team members can fit on that boat? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's 12 uh, currently. Yeah, so Small group. we're going we're gonna to make it happen for sure. Well, we've got a fleet, of course, of the county, so we can we can make it happen with other vessels as well. Excellent. Well, we'll we'll certainly uh, maybe take you up on that for a for a field trip this upcoming summer. Uh, let's uh, let's go ahead to Elizabeth Kelly with Martin County. Okay, I think we're missing Elizabeth. Um, in the meantime, let's go ahead to Shelly Kruger with Monroe. Hello, thank you. In addition to representing Monroe County, I am extension faculty at the University of Florida and the Florida Sea Grant agent for Monroe County, which is a partnership, which is why I am asked to join this team, thankfully. And I also co-lead the communications team for Flora's Florida's Coral Reef Resilience Program. Thank you, Shelly. Great to have you here. Um, and uh, so I know Ian Enox and Chris Kellogg are away. Um, so that leaves us with Dr. Ralph from the Army Corps. Gina, are you available to back clean up? I am here. Can you all hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Gina Ralph with the Corps of Engineers. Um, happy to be here today um, and really happy to um, have some of our recovered team members present uh, on our conceptual ecological models. Uh, so nothing else to report. Uh, just happy to be here and um, hope you all enjoyed your holiday. Thank you so much. Uh, I also just very quickly want to acknowledge we have a working group member and a science coordination group member uh, joining us as attendees. So just uh, make sure to acknowledge Karen Bonsack from NOAA and Dr. Mark Raines from DEP, uh, the state's chief science officer. Thank you both for, uh, for keeping tabs on us um, and continuing to help steer us in the right direction. Um, we're gonna move on to the meeting summary approval and kind of just keep this thing rolling. Um, hopefully everybody's had a chance to review uh, that summary that Alan uh, sent out earlier um, in the month. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead now and ask for a motion and a second to approve those uh, that summary. I'll move to approve the summary. Do I have a second? I'll second. second. Great. Uh, do we have any discussion on the item? All right. Anyone opposed to approving the minutes, please raise your hand using the raise your hand feature on the Zoom platform. I'll give everybody about five seconds. And Alan, you can let me know if we have any. Any hands raised? I don't see any hands raised. And just as a reminder, um, when you're speaking, please um, mention your name because I wasn't quick enough to hear and identify who made the motion. Or who so that was Nikki. Second. I'm sorry, that was <laughs> Nikki Morgan who made the motion. And we had fantastic chime in on the second. So I know Eric was one of them. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Thank y'all. I appreciate it. It looks good on the on the minutes. No hands raised, Wes. 
Great. Well, we will consider those uh, those minutes approved. Thank you very much. Um, we'll now move on to uh, just a, I think will be a, a relatively brief discussion on the monitoring framework, but you all feel free to uh, to extend it as much as you want. Um, we're really, uh, really glad uh, to be able to have uh, achieved a, a 10-0 consensus vote. Um, to, to move this product forward to the Working Group and Science Coordination Group um, for their visibility. Um, as, as you all know, um, this framework um, is really focused on, um, I think, a, a pretty great narrative summary of, of the situation um, in the South Florida ecosystem, the, the critical importance of Florida's coral reef, um, not just as a component of that system, but to the people and communities that live within that system, and also lays out 10 coordinated actions um, that each of the agencies represented here on this team um, are, are committed towards working to fulfilling. Um, and so I think, you know, given our We've, I think, been chartered for just over a year now. I think that's incredible progress um, that we've all been able to make. And, and I think it's worthy of just a, a moment of quiet celebration um, just to get this far. So congratulations. Thank you all for your very hard work. Um, I also want to specifically recognize um, Karen Bonesack, Victoria Barker, Samantha Cook, and Kylie Morgan. Um, who all had um, significant roles to play, um, especially in the, the early drafting of, of this document. Um, so we, we stand on the shoulders of those giants and, and are very grateful uh, for their efforts. Uh, I think the, the key part now to, to understand as our, our group looks to our second year um, functioning is uh, essentially we we have a roadmap for for the work we need to continue to do now which as Eric referenced earlier really is to flesh out um what the action part of those coordinated actions will be um and so uh, Alan or Marsha if you could scroll down um to the start of that section just We'll walk everybody through that very quickly, just as a quick reminder. Um, so we have these first two actions are focused on inventorying um, existing water quality and biological or ecological monitoring programs. Um, and I think we've we've already made some very good progress on those fronts, specifically the water quality monitoring piece, thanks to um, the efforts funded by DEP and FWC through Dr. McEachern's group. Um, so we will continue to refine that um, into, into an inventory, which again, um, each of these coordinated actions will be tied to, I guess, what we'd call an action plan that will be linked through this framework document, right, to sort of guide how um, hopefully our agencies will will move forward in actually implementing these actions. Um, so just keep that that structure in mind. Um, as we scroll down to action um, actions three through six, I believe that are part of the um, defining an effective monitoring program section uh, of the document. Um, action three, I, I think, um, from my perspective, is is really the next big item to tackle for this group. Um, it, we we started touching on this a little bit in some of our discussions, and I think um, we all found very quickly how unwieldy that uh, that conversation can get. Um, and so, uh, one of the one of the suggestions I, I actually received from this team. Um, was the possibility of potentially working with partners um, outside of, of our agencies um, to create sort of uh, something akin to like a workshop setting um, where we could bring in additional experts, additional voices um, from outside the team to actually go through and work to answer some of these questions um, and allow the team um, uh, obviously to participate in that process, 
Um, but the team could also sit back a little bit and serve as um, more of a uh, an evaluator um, and a compiler of the information that that comes out of of those forums. Um, and so I think that's uh, I think that is an option worth discussing here. And so I'd like to open that concept up on the floor um, to whether you know, assuming you know, we work through all the resource issues and I don't think anybody needs to be worried about that um, at this point, but do we feel like, um, you know, a more, um, a, a broader workshop kind of concept would be helpful specifically uh, to this action? I think you've got a hand from Chris Sweetman there. Oh, yes, CJ. I, I am I am missing that. So CJ, please. Yeah, I think that's a good idea, Wes. I mean, <clears throat> trying to identify, I mean, within this, just this one action here, it's developing parameters for monitoring the coral reef. And it's also like the latter part of this, the associated resources with it. So I think getting some scientific experts that are focused on whether it's ecosystem-based management or things along those lines that are um, looking at a much broader scale would would be useful here because you know I, even in just in talking with Eric at during the field trip we were trying to like all right what species would you know if we're looking at a fish species or something like that what would be the species that we could utilize or something along those lines and I don't think there's a clean clear answer one way or the other I think there's pros and cons depending on what we look at further downstream so I I think it would be a valuable exercise to get people that are directly involved in some of this area of research to um, maybe have uh, like a panel discussion like you're talking about or a workshop along those lines that we could interact with. I think it's a really good idea. Dana. Thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I agree, but I, I'll add kind of a caveat, which is let's not, you know, pretend we're starting from a blank slate. There are existing monitoring programs and a lot of thought was put into the design of those programs. I think it's healthy to revisit those and make sure that the indicators selected and the data being collected are what's needed today to take the kind of action that's needed to address the problems we're facing today. Um, but I think it would you know, be beneficial um, and kind of give us you know, a jump start to start off by looking at the parameters and indicators that are being um, monitored currently. I, I I would agree with that too, Dana. And I I almost envision you know a workshop or 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 some event where we actually do bring in the PIs who are running those programs all together, um, and that can actually help us also make some headway on some of the later actions where where we we have sort of test ourselves as mediators to work through how we can sort of bring those programs into the the larger fold in ways that aren't you know super terribly difficult for for those programs to absorb um so i think having those conversations now and 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 starting to introduce ourselves and and have those programs introduce themselves to us um, in this way could I, I I just I think that's a, a good point to to build off of it. Eric, I agree. I agree with bringing those those monitoring program leads um, involving them in the workshop. I think that's a great idea. I think um, Dana, CJ, both of you have me thinking about this kind of two pieces, the uh, phrases that are come to mind are dynamic and attributable. Um, the dynamic piece is that we're looking at um, sampling programs that exist that change over time according to the projects and purposes of those individual programs, but we're trying to connect that to what we need for the reef, which is kind of, I think, a longer term vision perhaps than some of the other. Maybe that's an assumption on my part. I'm not sure. But, but we have to have something when we're building this that allows it to be a dynamic living approach to tracking these needs, making sure we're getting the right monitoring in the right places. Um, 
And we're watching out for things like changes in funding and support for them so that we recognize and don't lose, you know, a critical program that had a five-year lifespan loses funding, but we need it for 10 years beyond that. So we, we have to be aware of that. So there's something dynamic that happens there. And then attributable is the other thing that was standing out to me. And I think a big part of this, including getting the PI support, um, would be to look at the individual programs and think about how the information they collect can be attributed to environmental factors that are influenced by the Everglades Restoration Program and water management upstream. So that is the key of this team as a coordination team to be making those connections. And, uh, and that in a way, I think that attribution helps us stay in our lane, kind of. And um, anyways, I throw those two thoughts out to the team in case it brings up some other thoughts. Very well taken. Any Anyone else have any thoughts they'd like to chime in on uh, on that or action three in general? Joanna. Yeah, I think I'll just add, um, uh, many of us have mentioned the, the group, the Florida's Coral Reef Resilience Program, uh, which is standing up a new water quality focused priority. Uh, and we have been, some of us overlap between the two groups. And I think it would be in our best interest to find ways to collaborate with that group um, so that we are actively connecting the dots between the work that that group is doing and the work that we're doing and not overlapping. Uh, but they also bring to the table some really phenomenal facilitation uh, support that we could bring to bear in a large workshop like this. Uh, and many of the technical water quality experts uh, that we might be hoping to include are, are already a part of that group. Not all of them, for sure, um, especially as we discuss water quality. But um, it's just an opportunity, I think, to, to merge some of the, the high-level priorities that we've all been working towards. Uh, I'll also add that the uh, the department in, under my program now has a, a dedicated coordinator to help facilitate this as well, and so I'm happy to to offer um, some staff resources to help pull whatever this looks like off. Well, that's very generous, and uh, we will definitely be taking you up on that. <laughs> um, so, and obviously, um, I think these sessions can can look a, a lot of different ways. They can have more or less team involvement. Um, so we can sort of figure that out. Um, but so we'll uh, we'll maybe get back with Joanna specifically about what what you're offering here um, and start maybe charting a course for what what some of that might look like and and bring that back to the team um, for uh, for more suggestions and and moving forward. But that sounds like, Everybody would rather have a larger group of folks help sort through that than us do it for three hours at a time on Zoom. So uh, that that sounds excellent to me. Um, additionally, uh, within this uh, priority focus area, um, and and I think what you know may end up taking up the bulk of our time next year. Um, in in my initial read, you know, beyond you know finalizing. The doc, the action plans associated with numbers one and two, and and helping to collaborate and coordinate on on all those water quality parameters. Um, actions four, five, and six. We can scroll down just a little bit, Marsha. Um, action four, um, I I honestly feel is is probably pretty simple. It just requires us to sit down or maybe have uh, the water management district and the core together sit down um, with us and identify you know, those projects, water management activities and operational schedules um, that, that you know, really you know, we would tend to think would have a lot of, of influence. Um, and you know, perhaps there's some level of, um, of shading or prioritization um, that, that we might provide those with obviously the nearest you know, most uh, most immediate uh, projects to the coast, obviously probably having a little bit more influence than than others further upstream, but depending on volumes and things like that, we, we might want to keep our eye on some of those. Um, Gina, 
Do you want to chime in on this? Hi, Wes. Um, yes, I actually have a list that I can just send you and then you all can review it if, if that would be helpful. It's beautiful. Thank you. Sure. That's that's the kind of outstanding work we we pride here in the in the team. <laughs> Thank you, Gina. So, yeah, like I said, maybe maybe that one's pretty easy. Um, uh, slightly, uh, and and then the more interesting part of that, I think, is you know looking at um, then the integrated delivery schedule, um, and then also thinking about opportunities for the team um, to provide comment and um, guidance to the working group and science coordination group and ultimately the task force um, that reflects um, you know more of a perspective on on the reef and downstream resources um, which I, I think most of us would agree um, and and for good reason though um, has been historically lacking. So that 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 is our role here. Um, actions five and six. Um, honestly, today's presentations are all geared around actions four, five, and six. So we're going to hear a little bit more about um, some of the BBC -er modeling work that's taken place and dive a little bit more into. Um, what what those influences and impacts on the coastal system may be from from various uh, infrastructure and operations that may take place with that project. Um, we're also going to hear a little bit more about um, how Recover um, uses conceptual ecological models and ecological indicators, and then also uh, take a deeper dive on um, some previously developed conceptual ecological models for Florida's coral reef. Um, so this really is, uh, I guess today's presentations are really designed to get uh, get your your thoughts provoked on uh, on making some progress on, on actions four, five, and six. Um, and then if we scroll down to identifying monitoring gaps, um, I think it's pretty clear that it's going to be hard to do that without understanding the monitoring that we'd like to achieve um, and what we're trying to get out of it. Um, and so to me, um, actions seven and eight speak to kind of the next phase of work. Um, and then certainly actions nine and 10 um, really are about, you know, putting pencils down and uh, and and working on implementation. Um, so um, again, I think I, you know, in 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 looking back on it, you know, a year went into putting forward a, a four page roadmap for for our work going forward. Um, doesn't sound all that impressive when it's stated uh, so succinctly like that, but I think the fact that we have all these agencies. Um, you know, moving forward with with a plan um, to tackle these items, I think actually is very impressive. And again, um, a lot of thanks to everybody who who participated in this process. And in uh, the real work starts now, right? As Eric uh, mentioned before too. So we look forward to to keeping everybody engaged um and uh and and trying to flesh out these action plans um and build um a framework that can can truly carry us all forward um and and help us do our job to protect this resource and and bring it back um better better than ever at some point so um i i'd welcome any other comments um i, I think my soliloquy is done so anybody that has any other comments um, or questions on the document as it stands today, um, please raise your hands, um, jump in. Great, you maintain that consensus, that, that's good. <laughs> All right. We will uh, we'll now uh, move on uh, to that discussion on uh, that the more in-depth discussion on Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project. And I'd like to invite Dr. Ralph 
um, to introduce our panelists. Hi, good afternoon. Um, so today we have um, April Patterson. Uh, she will be giving a presentation for the Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades uh, Restoration Project. Um, April, I think I saw you on the line. Are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready. Excellent. Start sharing my screen. Okay, can you see my screen yet? Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for including Robert Kirby and I on today's um, in today's meeting to talk about Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades Ecosystem Restoration Project. Um, I'm going to present some updates about our schedule, uh, kind of give folks an overview of existing conditions and future without project conditions, project objectives, alternatives. Um, so you can understand where we are, where we're headed, and the areas that we're trying to impact. Robert will be available for any questions. He is our ecosystem sub-team lead and working on looking, evaluating the performance measures to measure the improvements to the ecosystem or measure the performance of the project. Uh, hopefully they're all improvements. So this is the latest schedule. We have been working, waiting on the Interagency Modeling Center for SERP for the Comprehensive Everglades Restoration Plan um, to complete our third round of alternatives. And I'll share those alternatives with you we, uh, the next step, we'll be having a meeting uh, next month to, to hear about the, the, um, the H, H model results. And then for all of the principal investigators to begin analysis of, of the ecological performance, the uh, water supply and flood protection performance, uh, any water quality up related updates. So We've been a little bit quiet while we've been waiting for those modeling results and those will be coming up. Uh, we're just now like finishing up QAQC and getting ready to share those with the pup, with the PDT and, and, and everyone. So that's where we are. So a little bit longer timeline, we've realized for the amount of tools that we have. So I know, you know, when we released the round two, with sea level rise, it was, it was um, all the tools were mature. There's a lot of information to digest. And so we're really looking forward to taking the time between now and the spring to understand those, those um, results. So for some of you, you may be wondering, okay, well, the schedule is great and everything. What is she talking about? So let me just give you a little um, overview of what we're talking about here. So you, you know, in Everglades, you have our historic condition, where we exist today, and then the study area highlighted in red. And then looking at our future without, we've been modeling using the intermediate sea level curve to make, sh and using these salinity model tools, like the, the Biscayne salinity model, Biscayne Bay salinity model, simulation model, excuse me, and the bisect model to look at how salinity is impacting uh, the ecological performance or how we're working with the, you know, how we're benefiting those natural areas depending on salinity and understanding the role that, that sea level rise plays there. So trying, as the graphic in the bottom shows, we're trying to get back to the more historic condition to, and away from the pulses that we have in the wet season from from a canal discharge, and then, then also looking at the sea level rise challenges and making assumptions there that about the, the coastal canal structures and, and the water moving within the system um, with sea level. This is an overview of the various 
um, salinities across the landscape as it as it changes from freshwater wetlands to um, to the near shore area. And the the map on the right showing the areas that that BBC is interested in uh, measuring and seeing those improvements. So Biscayne Bay and Biscayne National Park, the model land Southern Glades, the Eastern Panhandle of Everglades National Park, Card Sound, Barn Sound, and Manatee Bay, um, and just an overview of the flora and fauna there. The project objectives, therefore, um, looking at some of the things I've been talking about, the the um, the improvement of quantity, qu timing, and distribution of the fresh water. You can see our planning strategy here on the right. You know, we're trying to bring water from the northwest, where it's coming in from these, from further upstream, from SERP restoration, and then conveying it down through the developed Miami-Dade County and then redistributing it along those natural areas that I just talked about. Okay, so restoring the salinity regimes and unnatural canal releases, working on those freshwater wetlands and ponding durations and reconnecting ecological and hydrological um, gradients. And then sea level change and resiliency. Uh, some of you are aware of the the work that's been done on the adaptive foundational resilience performance measure and looking at um, mangroves and the ability to accrete and and in general the, the project overall to to be have a more resilient ecosystem ecosystem and and ecological habitats um, to deal with sea level the plant this study looks out from about 2035 to about 2085. It's really looking at that long-term picture. Just to, I'll go through these a little bit, uh, a little bit as quick as I can. I definitely want wanted you to have these as a reference. Uh, I want you to engage and understand what we're doing and where we're going. And I think that the work you're doing is really great. Um, we, I feel like we're a little underrepresented on how this project and the keys interact. We're getting ready to get into monitoring. So having this information may be helpful to you. Uh, so I'll just say real quickly, this, this, these couple of slides, look at the hydrology changes in the round two results and try to capture what happens between the existing condition and the future without, and in the future without all of these projects coming online and providing fresh water um, to the southeastern Everglades. Uh, Drew Komen, along with others, did an analysis across these transects. And I've, we've wanted to understand how the water is moving and to be able to follow the water. Good luck. Um, so I won't go through each of them now. But we're looking at the change between the future without and then how the projects are improving and just to see where the water goes. The next slide I'll show you, we'll, we'll look at this coastal ridge. Um, and that's a kind of a challenging area, but kind of shows how water can move from that northwest further south, as well as the mega transect, which I won't show today. Um, and that water in generally is staying, is staying in Everglades National Park um, and that and the water that's available um, for use for Biscayne Bay is able to get, that the project is improving where that um, water is available, where that water is, is used and is benefiting the environment. These are some of the alternatives, just in general, looking, we're trying to use pumps. Um, this is Pensuco wetlands. Um, on way on the left on alternative 21, and then pushing water out, you know, conveying it down through existing canals, and then using pumps like we have with Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands to move water out into the bay and redistribute it. And then in the Southern Glades and model lands using spreader canals. And each of these are a little bit different. Alternative 24 does not bring in that water that I showed you in the previous graph from 
further upstream um, from Everglades restoration projects. It just uses the available water in, in, the, in the system. And what we see when we look at that um, um, Biscayne Bay, the coastal ridge for Biscayne Bay, when we realigned it with the structures, so we'll probably be renaming it a little bit. But basically what that's showing is that we are getting more fresh water from the Northwest. Uh, we're, we're improving the dry season flows and the wet season flows. But in alternative 24, where we didn't have that connection, uh, we have less, less of, a, of a lift, less of an improvement. So then we took all that information into round three to try to maximize what's coming, um, what's being that water source from the Northwest, how we're moving it across Miami-Dade County and how we're using it to store and rehydrate those target areas. Uh, so we have two alternatives, this um, alternative 31 and 32 major difference there. There are some major differences between those two to kind of look at what how things are performing. Um, the water sourcing, this one has Pensuco and this one does not. And these are the three major areas, you know, the, the sourcing, the how it's moving, conveying, and then re redistributing that we talked about with that kind of bubbly graphic. And I'm just gonna sco scooch through these. Um, this is an area you may be interested in, the coastal wetlands, how we're hydrating that. These, these two are fairly similar. We're concerned about seepage here and um, getting water across the L31 East corridor. Um, looking here at, you know, definitely trying to provide water across the Southern Glades and provide flood protection trying to optimize the, the, the quantity of water and timing of water in the model lands, which spreader feature works better. Uh, and Robert can answer any questions on those. Um, so looking, we're gonna, we're also looking at sensitivity runs for adding wastewater reuse. Um, we've looked at ASR. We're not, we're not carrying that one forward into the round three, but this is from a previous presentation we are looking at engineering details and operations. And I'm not gonna go through these habitat slides because I just don't think we have time, but uh, talking about those ecological performance measures, these are, this kind of shows how they all kind of come together. Um, and I can provide more information on that to you guys. There's a, we have all these presentations on our website and they're not too long. Um, Maybe, you know, maybe, um, it, you know, you can flip through and get a good idea and then attend our, some of our next meetings and get a good wrap up. I just wanted to show that what we're looking at for water quality, you know, we're looking at numeric nutrient criteria. We're looking at outstanding Florida water um, criteria and trying to be, protect, and, and we not, we're not, um, we need to maintain those. So the OFW rules are, are um, maintained through permitting actions. And we'll be doing monitoring to is, ensure that we maintain that water quality, just like we did with Biscayne Bay Coastal Wetlands and building off of that monitoring. So, and then this was also shared back in, um, in August. And the link here, it does talk about this pest monitoring program, uh, but the this link is to the water quality for each of those round two alternatives. You can go in there and look at that if you wanted to. So that's provided for you. So what's next for BBCR? So we'll be doing on the 20th, we'll just go through those transects, talk with you guys about what's happening, how, how, you know, how are we able to optimize those two alternatives and the sensitivity runs for wastewater reuse. And then we'll begin engaging um, 
with these sub teams to further understand. And that will take a significant amount of time because of the number of performance measures that you saw there when I went through that slide uh, for the habitat units. So Robert will be leading that group, uh, the water quality. There is a group of folks that have been looking at the water quality and they'll continue to provide updates. Um, and we'll start working on developing that engineering design for the draft report. What's new and exciting, I think, from your perspective, may be that um, Robert and his team are, are working with Recover and working you know, on an adaptive management plan. We do that for all of our CERT projects. You know, what things, what risks and uncertainties are there with our current plan? Uh, there are many because we're at the planning level and what monitoring way we, might we need to be able to inform those adaptive management actions that are needed. Um, and so I think the, the, the monitoring and adaptive management could be very compatible with the work that you guys are doing and these revised conceptual ecological models. So I hope this information is helpful and um, I got Robert here with me and we're ha happy to answer any of your questions and Dr. Ralph as well, because she's an expert in this, in this area. So thank you. Thank you, April. Um, so yeah, I would open it up. Welcome folks to ask uh, any questions you'd like. As a reminder to the folks that were engaged in the uh, team trip, obviously we were within the BBC or study area. So, Eric. I'm just going to toss it right back to April or Robert to come on, uh, um, on mic for us to talk a little bit about, we mentioned water quality in here, and I think that for those that have spent less time with restoration programs overall, we may not understand kind of where I guess some of the nuances of USA's authority related to water quality on these projects and that idea of of protecting um, OFW and holding a standard as opposed to developing new water quality improvement processes. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, but I'm kind of trying to cue that up for you to explain how it works on your end. I, I think you said it. I think you said it just as well as I would. I don't know if um, Gina or or Robert have can provide additional input um, uh, before I toss it over to them completely. I'll just say, you know, we have been looking at how we're improving aspects of the project and water quality just by where we're moving the water to flow. So um, moving water further south, I think has, has had a positive effect on the northern part of the bay. Um, but, you know, so Robert or, or Gina, do you guys have any other things to add about water quality? So um, this is Gina. Um, from the Corps of Engineers perspective, um, there are certain projects within the comprehensive Everglades restoration plan framework that was uh, authorized by Congress in 2000 that have a water quality component to them, meaning that specific components of a project are set in place to improve water quality. For our Biscayne Bay and Southeastern Everglades restoration project, it is not one of those projects that was defined within um, the 2000 authorization for improvements to water quality. So here we treat water quality as a constraint. And as April mentioned, all of the existing water quality criteria will be upheld. We have to have an assessment method in order to understand whether or not we have um, potential conflicts with existing uh, water quality conditions. But one of the improvements that you'll see, one of the ancillary benefits always of removing point source discharges, such as backfilling canals or reducing canal um, uh, discharges within that area, would be an overland sheet flow where the water would flow naturally over the existing and restored wetlands to help improve water quality conditions in the downstream areas. Um, so one component of water quality that um, many of our folks uh, don't 
think of when we think of water quality is salinity. Um, and we have a salinity performance measures in which we are trying, and it's actually a goal of the project, right, to uh, obtain these mesohaline con um, conditions within Biscayne Bay by restoring that overland sheet flow. Um, so we do anticipate we'll have ancillary water quality benefits. We will abide by all um, permitting rules, regulations, um, water quality designations by the state of Florida as to not um, have any adverse impacts from our project as they relate to water quality. Um, so hopefully that addresses uh, the question, Eric. Yeah, I, I, you know, I feel <laughs> I thank you for speaking up on it, both of you on this and uh, I feel like I, I personally feel that I understand those differences, but I wanted to hear it from you for the to others on the team and uh, audience that we have here today. It's a good question, and I and the other item that I thought about while Gina was talking, is we're redistributing, especially in this area, we have. Um, these. Um, I guess you want to, what do we call them? Water um, preservation areas. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that, Robert? No, it's it, not not uh, in depth, but that's just a, the feature here. And it's uh, an effort to um, uh, store water, which you haven't seen in BBCW, store water along the coastline for uh better uh, geographic distribution and also temporal distribution, you know, holding it uh, into the dry season to improve the, the uh, salinity in the first uh, 500 meters or so of the shoreline and the near shore, uh, in, improving that uh, nursery habitat. And there may be some ancillary water quality improvements in the holding and, and uh, uptake of any nutrients. That's my understanding. Yeah, that would be anticipated as well. Well, that makes the connection. We talked about the coastal, you know, uh, mesohaline nursery habitat and connections to the reefs. So I think that is, uh, yeah, that makes the connection to where we're going with the next couple presentations. So thank you. Great, great. I'm so glad. I'll look forward to um, seeing some of you guys at BBC and, um, and maintaining some communication between the efforts that you're doing. I really like to hear about about the work that you're um, continuing and thank you for for being a part of this um florida's coral reef task force thanks Be before you all jump off i just want to make sure any other questions amongst the group on the on the technical side of, of what we just saw um april um mm -hmm. thank you if if folks want to get a little bit more knowledgeable, get more engaged, um, what opportunities do they have, especially when it comes to like PDT meetings and things like that? How do they find out more? Well, definitely um, you can let us know through these, this email or um, your, you can share my email if you would like to be connected with one of our sub teams and participate in our sub team meetings, our web, our, Project delivery team meetings, those are usually about once a month, um, as often as once a month. And those are posted on the website. We'll put a press release out. The one for the 20th is not out yet, but you'll be, find all the information you need to participate in those. And if you let me know your email address, I can add you to our um, distribution list. So thanks. I, I wonder as well if it m might not be useful um, to have a volunteer or there may be folks who who naturally congregate to these presentations already to, to actually participate on some level and, and actually report back to this group on a on a regular basis for for folks who aren't able to engage that that might be worthwhile on certain projects um, that uh, that may prove more influential to to the reef. So that's something we can talk about um, going forward too. Um, and then I also just want to raise uh, before you leave April. Um, so it is a charter responsibility of this group under 4F that we review components of CERP for impacts to Florida's coral reef and offer recommendations to secure or enhance the delivery of project benefits to Florida's coral reef and associated resources. 
Um, for folks who have not engaged in the PDT process before, what what is the best way for the team as a whole to do that from your experience? This is where Robert is the lead for, for that, um, to draw those conclusions. And uh, Robert, I'm just gonna pass that over to you. Yeah, uh, the um, eco sub team is the forum, and it well, we uh, typically meet weekly. Um, but th there's there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, there's the the eco sub team meetings. Uh, there's also, the, as April said, the PDT means the 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 whole team uh, once a month project delivery team meets. It's another opportunity to provide provide input. Um, and again, um, as we get to the release of the round three modeling results, uh, these meetings are going to occur more frequently um, uh, and for uh, hours at a time to try to get through uh, an understanding of what the response is um, to the water management features that we're, we're uh, discussing about, uh, discussing implementation of. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. Uh, there's also a water quality sub team uh, that uh, might be most relevant for, for this group. Uh, and Jim Riley from the core heads that up along with many folks from the South Florida Water Management District. That's another opportunity that uh, you could avail yourselves of. Great, appreciate that information. And I, th I think we'll definitely chew on that. Um, and I'm glad the timeline slide is back up. Um, so it looks like your agency decision milestone where are we expecting that um, next year sometime? Oh, it doesn't. It doesn't have a. It doesn't have a, a date on it. Um, yeah, I think that will. We'll have the tentatively selected plan milestone. Um, looking looking after this gross appraisal, so sometime in early twenty twenty five, okay. uh, is a projection right now, uh, and I, th I think some of Robert's comments. I wanted to let you know that that is the work that the eco sub team is doing is geared towards the draft. Um, it's a project implementation report and an environmental impact statement. Um, and that report will look at those impacts. So any impacts that you're foreseeing with coral reef would would be things that Robert could include in in the NEPA documentation. Okay. Great. No, and that's helpful. So it does look like this, uh, if this was something the group wanted to engage in as we continue our other work, um, this upcoming year is is the year for us to do so. So we'll we'll keep track of that. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll circle back and see um, if there's other ways that uh, members want to engage. Laura, I see your hand is up. Yeah, thanks, Wes. Um, I really just kind of wanted to mention for the team, just so they're aware, and this is Laura Eldridge, Miami County, you know, it's not just BBC here, right? So um, our report has really been working strongly on this project integration. There's, I believe, eight actual uh, Army Corps studies within Miami Dade County right now. Um, several of them are related to CERT benefits, or they're working within the footprint of BBC here as well. So there's a lot of opportunities for our team members here to get involved in other studies as well that'll help contribute to those downstream benefits. Absolutely, yeah. And I think that is, that's kind of a key part of Action 4, right? Identifying those, those components that are important uh, to the downstream um, so that we know what we're looking at as, uh, as these projects are, are working through um, analysis and evaluation and 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 ultimately uh you know getting getting stood up for congressional authorization gina please hi good afternoon again um so yes laura's laura's absolutely right we have stood up a new integration team um, that is working across the core's business lines um, we divide ourselves into these various business lines from 
deep draft navigation to aquatic ecosystem restoration to flood risk management and coastal storm uh, risk management. Um, and so within that Miami-Dade County footprint, there are um, up to eight projects ongoing at once. Uh, some of them do overlap extensively. Um, I can talk uh, with our folks here. Uh, perhaps uh, Tim Geisen can come and give an overview uh, to this team of all of the things that we're doing within that uh, footprint in Miami-Dade County at a future meeting if there is interest. Thank you. Any other comments before we let April and Bob go? All right, thank you all very much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you soon, I'm sure. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, we are going to uh, go on in our agenda to talk about recover conceptual ecological models. So moving from action four to action five. Uh, Eric, do you want to uh, introduce your team? Well, um, um, Melody from your team, I should say. I should say Melody's, Melody's the only one from my team on this. Melody's been holding a, Melody Hunt has been holding a key role in working on these conceptual ecological models for a few years now. Um, very comfortable, very close working in our team and the Army Corps of Engineers together on these, uh, which I think is just a great sign of the type of collaboration that is necessary to make this this uh, work down here. I'd asked her if she would be interested in this um, and she stepped right up. So I was, I was very happy to see that. Um, I'll pass it to Gina to do the next step. Hi everyone. So Dr. Stephanie Verholst along with uh, Dr. Melody Hunt are both um, regional coordinators for restoration coordination and verification or recover for our Southern coastal systems. And uh, we asked them to come and present on behalf of Recover an overview of the conceptual ecological models and hypothesis clusters, and then uh, kind of focus on how we implement them in the Southern coastal systems and how they may be applicable or implemented as part of this team. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to um, Melody and Stephanie, thanks. Hello, good afternoon. Um, this is Stephanie. I'm from the Army Corps, as Gina mentioned. Um, so we will uh, move to the next slide to get into the presentation. All right, so we kind of put together an outline uh, for it uh, to keep you guys uh, understanding where we're trying to go with uh, our presentation. And a number of you are very familiar with Recover, but knowing that some people, some of you aren't, um, we wanted to provide uh, an overview of what Recover is, how we use um, a science strategy to try to frame um, the development of conceptual ecological models. So here I apologize for the uh, acronym. CEM is the conceptual ecological models. And uh, we are in the Southern Coastal Systems region. So if you see SCS, um, that would be the Southern Coastal Systems uh, module or region of Recover. And Melody is going to talk about examples um, that we have uh, for specifically Biscayne Bay. And then we also have um, hypothesis clusters that we've developed that uh, Melody will uh, give an example of water quality. Um, next slide. All right, so Recover, um, we're part of uh, the conceptual, uh, sorry, the comprehensive uh, Everglades restoration plan, um, programmatic regulations, they, you know, have us included as part of the, the uh, framework of SERP. Um, we are, you know, considered the science and technical arm of SERP and, and made up of multi-agency teams of scientists, modelers, planners, um, and resource specialists. We represent 10 agencies uh, and the Miccosukee Tribe of Indians of Florida and the Seminole Tribe of Florida. And uh, as part of our task, uh, we organize and apply science, uh, scientific and technical information in ways that are essential in supporting the objectives of, uh, of SERP. And one of the ways that we do this is by conducting scientific and uh, technical evaluations and assessments um, to assess it um, and be able to um, 
understand ways to improve SERP's ability to restore, preserve, and protect um, the South Florida ecosystems while providing for the region's other water-related needs. Um, and this uh, provides the ability for Recover to uh, communicate and coordinate SERP performance and suggest refinement and improvements on a project level, while also ensuring restoration uh, activities can maintain a system-wide perspective. Um, next slide. Uh, so RECOVER plays an important role in ensuring the best available science is used. And so best available science, uh, meaning you know, continually incorporating new information um, for the development or, and implementation and evaluation of SERP. Um, and we want to use, or we have developed three major missions. Um, one is to assess um, the, the performance of projects uh, through research and monitoring. Um, we also want to evaluate uh, the projects, so forecasting project performance um, pre um, through predictive models and performance measures that we develop. And then also um, part of planning uh, for SERP really requires a lot of uh, scientific knowledge and information. Um, so we are an integral part of the planning process um, for the different projects. Um, next slide. Uh, so to tackle some of these objectives that we have, um, we develop uh, ecological, um, conceptual ecological models and hypotheses for the various landscapes and ecosystems of South Florida um, to understand just the different ecological interactions. And then from these models that we have uh, developed, we have then established a monitoring and assessment plan or, or known as MAP. Um, that allows us to evaluate and assess uh, SERP restoration success. And because of the expansive area and the diverse ecosystems of the Everglades, um, we have individual modules within Recover that were created um, to provide a, a regional level of uh, organization for the um, for the systems. And so originally we had four different um, modules at Lake Okeechobee. We had the Northern Estuaries, which were Caloosahatchee and uh, St. Lucie. We also then have the you know, Greater Everglades, that is the, um, the main portion of, of the Everglades. And then at the south, we have in the pink, um, the Southern Coastal Systems um, running from Biscayne Bay all the way uh, to the southwest coast, like the 10,000 Islands area. Um, and then also in the map, you can see a big yellow blob. Um, it is our newest module. It is the Southwest Florida module that incorporates part of the coast and then also part of the freshwater systems. Um, next. Uh, so part of uh, Recover Science uh, strategy, we wanted to develop a framework to connect ecosystems uh, to monitoring and restoration success, and starting with the um, conceptual ecological models. So that flow chart you see, um, we have that you know broad overview of or the, the larger um, frame of reference with the um, conceptual ecological models serving as a basis to understand ecological processes, interactions, um, responses. Um, and they're also used to formulate uh, hypotheses that can describe um, not only what attributes or indicators are important, um, but why changes occur. And from these, we can then identify ecological monitoring needs uh, necessary to establish baseline or pre-SERP conditions and assess project-related uh, responses. Um, and so, also, the conceptual ecological models and hypotheses, we can um, guide and, and develop performance measures um, based on important ecological indicators um, that then assist in evaluating CERT projects and then track uh, restoration um, uh, progress. Um, so this framework informs CERP's uh, project implementation and the adaptive management needs. Um, it's not just a top-down process. Uh, for example, the ecological monitoring um, provides necessary information to reevaluate our understanding of the conceptual ecological models 
and to assess hypotheses, but also helps to validate and inform um, ways of developing uh, the performance measures that we have. Uh, next slide, please. All right, and so conceptual ecological models um, are definitely non-quantitative planning tools um, that help managers and planners uh, understand the complexities and the ecological linkages in the Everglades between the major um, natural and anthropogenic drivers and stressors, um, but also the effects on the system attributes. Um, the uh, conceptual ecological models also help understand what causes the ecosystem to change. Um, from these uh, models, so they are diagrams like flowcharts, um, but also we have um, you know, extensive documentation and, and, um, and you know, written narratives that help um, synthesize and organize um, existing knowledge of the ecosystem. So they're a visual diagram as well as explanation of, of the system and, and the interactions. Um, next slide. Um, so then uh, how we develop the um, CEMs, uh, the framework, we have uh, a top-down organization or orientation that includes drivers, stressors, and ecological effects, as well as attributes. Um, so starting with the drivers, uh, these represent um, any type of physical or biological force that can significantly influence the natural system. Um, these can be uh, natural forces such as sea level rise, fire, or water availability, um, but also anthropogenic, which would come to or you know involve water management or um, land use. And so uh, leading to the next level, we have stressors, and these are physical, chemical, or biological agents or mechanisms. Uh, that are brought about by the drivers and are known to cause significant changes in the ecological components or even patterns and relationships in the system. Um, they can also then uh, ha have been known to trigger uh, ecological effects or also affect different attributes of the ecosystem. Uh, when I mention ecological effects, so these can be physical, chemical, or biological responses to the stressors. On um, their dynamic processes, they can be positive or negative, or even have a neutral, um, you know, response to or uh, effect on the system. Um, and they depend on you know different spatial or conceptual scales um, in which are they're affected by the different stressors. Lastly, we have attributes, and these are uh, a parsimonious subset of eco ecosystem components um, that are thought to be representative of the overall um, ecological conditions. So attributes could be um, populations, species, guilds, um, or just processes in general. Um, and we typically refer to these as indicators or even endpoints um, in the system. And We've identified for recovery, we kind of identified uh, the different attributes um, based on their known or hypothesized uh, sensitivity to the ecological effects that have been identified. Um, but there are also elements of the ecosystem that are highly valued um, by a wide variety of people, whether it is an endangered species, but also, you know, recreational or sport fishing. So not, not just natural um, value, but also um, human value. Um, so that is kind of how we've uh, framed our conceptual ecological models. And I wanted to give you kind of the definitions of what we work with, because a lot of um, people within Recover, we want to, you know, we even have different ideas of, of what uh, an ecological effect is. So we, we've established uh, across all of the different modules, these very, um, you know, uh, straightforward definitions that we can always make sure that we're referring to the same type of, um, of function for the different levels. Um, so that is just kind of a broad overview of Recover and uh, our conceptual ecological models and um, the science framework. And, and Melody will take us through the Southern Coastal Systems and the examples that we have. Next slide. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, as Stephanie said, I'm gonna talk 
little more specifically about what we've done in the Southern coastal systems. And first I wanted to start off by just kind of showing, you know, where we are. I know um, Stephanie showed a, a earlier slide of the overview of the modules within the whole system, but um, the Southern coastal system really, it encompasses a fairly large area. Um, and we have broken it down into three different regions within the Southern coastal systems. We have the Florida Bay coastal systems uh, on this graph is shown in red. The Biscayne Bay coastal systems, which is, well, it's hard to distinguish, it's yellow. <laughs> yeah, hard to distinguish from the green, which is the um, Everglades to freshwater marine ecotone, which really encompasses um, everything from mangroves to your saltwater and freshwater uh, wetlands, upland wetlands, all the way up to the freshwater ecotone. Um, all contain a mosaic of different habitats um, within each of those, those zones. But um, there's some geomorphological and other differences between the regions that um, you know, made us decide to make them three separate regions. And so from that, um, we do have different uh, ecological models for each of the regions. And I'm gonna highlight today the Biscayne Bay coastal, coastal systems. Next slide, please. So um, I wanna go back to just a moment. I know that um, Stephanie really described the um, the drivers and the stressors and, and some of our elements that we use. But um, I wanted to show, first of all, the basic structure of, of what our ecological models um, consist of. The, the drivers really represent a large spatial change um, where the stressors become more focused. Um, and then the ecological effects is really looking at more of a system of effects on, on the ecologic system. Um, attributes, I, I think uh, Stephanie mentioned, are something that are measurable in the system. So we kind of go from top to bottom, from the drivers to the attributes. Now, this basic format was used in the original conceptual ecological models um, that came out around the 2004-2005 timeframe. Um, and we have been updating uh, all of, throughout the system, throughout the, the Everglades and, and all of the um, the different sub teams have been updating our our ecologic models and our um, hypothesis clusters. So you know it had been quite a while since the last update. There was uh, somewhat of an update around the 2009 um, era, but this is really the the more formal <laughs> update that that we've been involved in for the last couple of years, really. Now, uh, next slide. So. Um, one of the changes that we made um, in this last recent update is that we grouped the elements. Instead of just doing the basic approach um, where you have you know, one driver goes to one stressor, one effect, and one attribute, we found these types of graphs to be um, very busy. Um, we felt that by grouping, particularly the stressors and the effects, and as shown in the blue and the green, the middle part of the diagram, um, we were able to streamline the diagrams significantly. And again, these diagrams are simplistic kind of overviews. We, we don't, you don't want them to be too messy. You wanna convey what are your major drivers, your stressors, um, you know, your effects and, and your attributes. Next slide. So, as I said, I wanted to just kind of run through the example. I don't, I'm not gonna give you all of the, the the, the models that we did. I wanted to show the example of um, Biscayne Bay. I thought that that would be fairly relevant to this group. Um, and so starting with the drivers, um, you can see that we used uh, climate change, sea level rise. I'm gonna put on my glasses for a minute so I can see. Uh, water use um, and land use. And we used these same drivers for all of our CEMs. As I said, we, have, we do have a different CEM for the different uh, subregions of the Southern coastal systems, but we were consistent and used um, these same drivers. Now, um, these, these diagrams are simplistic. I do wanna point out that um, these drivers do have different time scales and they have different magnitudes of effects um, as, you, as you move down. Um, we toyed with the idea of you know, making them different sizes and or doing something different to represent that and, and ultimately decided to leave them in this simple form. 
Um, but it is important to, to note that they are, are also, they can be interrelated to each other. Hence your, your horizontal um, arrow shown there. So, you know, the relationships, you know, you have to note right off the bat, they're not simplistic, they are complicated. Um, uh, and and ex an example uh, of the different, you know, the magnitudes of these different drivers, um, the, the SERP, which is included in the water use and management, this also includes the, the SERP uh, effects. Um, once implemented, those changes can be seen fairly rapidly. Whereas something like sea level rise and climate patterns, those are slower changes that occur. But the caveat to that is once implemented. To get to that implementation phase, it does take many years, I think, as, as April showed in her slide of the timeline, line, the planning process alone takes several years. And then to get that authorized and funded and then actually a project to go into implementation and, um, and construction um, takes takes many more years. So in the meantime, um, while you're getting your project implemented, you can have significant land use changes or other water management changes occurring on the land on the landscape. Um, an example is, and I, I think was already mentioned, the um, the other projects, the flood resiliency projects that are occurring, particularly in the southern part of the system, uh, Miami Dade and Broward. Um, uh, is very relevant. Um, uh, there are changes that are being made. There are a lot of fast paced and fast tracked um, um, projects occurring. Um, so, uh, you know, having to do with flooding, flooding on the landscape. Um, and so these types of things, they're all, all projects and things that you do have to kind of uh, follow and integrate. And they, and they are being integrated now with the, um, the the restoration projects, but these are things that you that you have to think about. So you have all of these different types of um, changes occurring uh, with the drivers that are again on different time scales and and will occur in different uh, different magnitudes in different places throughout your system. Uh, next slide. So going down into the stressors, um, as I said, we chose to do a grouped approach um, in, in this updated round. Uh, so we have three different major groups of stressors and we've added some of the ovals to indicate some of the individual stressors within those groups. First one being um, you know, properties of water, changes in salinity, altered um, surface water conditions, nutrient um, inputs, change in water depth, um, and then climate related factors is another group. Um, some of your altered weather patterns, temperature, precipitation, you know, wind, atmospheric carbon, and you know, storms. And then your anthropogenic stressors um, for um, the near shore in the area that we've included in Biscayne Bay, we have marine debris, non-native invasive species, recreation and commercial practices, um, canal structure operations, and then some physical alterations that can occur such as dredging, um, seawalling. Next slide, please. So um, moving on then into the effects. Again, we've grouped these um, to streamline our diagrams a little bit better. Um, we have one major group is the water quality and the biogeochemistry um, uh, effects. Such examples would include um, algal biomass, acidification, stratification, light attenuation. And then you have the habitat related um, effects. And habitat, we kind of separated into two different, you can have function as well as um, quality, which is health, diversity, et cetera. Um, and then uh, the third uh, general grouping is the trophic processes. And this is where you have your species population and dynamics. Next slide. And then last but not least, um, we're showing the attributes. And again, these are the measurable uh, parts uh, of your of, of your diagram, what what the things that you can look at and measure. And here we have um, hard bottom communities uh, important in Biscayne Bay, coastal marshes and mangroves, phytoplankton, seagrasses, fish and invertebrate, 
um, colonial bird nesting efforts and, and crocodiling recruitments. Those are all considered important attributes um, in Biscayne Bay uh, for the restoration efforts. Next slide, thank you. Um, so now I wanna switch a little bit to the second step um, in this kind of science strategy that Stephanie had outlined. And that's um, developing hypothesis of the stressor response relationships. Um, so the hypothesis clusters, we call them, um, and we have another set of diagrams that go with the hypothesis hypothesis clusters, um, provide a refinement in the types and numbers of your performance measures and metrics. And they are very mu much linked to components that you want to um, monitor. So similar hypotheses are related to a particular stressor. Um, you know, for example, you could have salinity um, or another stressor. Um, or an attribute such as um, you know your your seagrasses. Um, so there we have them clustered together to help establish and focus kind of functional groupings. Um, but like the CEMs, the hypothesis clusters uh, will depict causal relationships among the different um, components, and again provide refinement to the conceptual ecological monitors. And what this really does is helps us identify monitoring and research needs. Um, there's monitoring needs, but there's also gaps. You have to acknowledge where there's gaps in our information. And that's where the uncertainties come in by listing out what your uncertainties are within certain topics can help drive where you may need additional research um, and, and ultimately plan and help design some of the restoration programs. Um, next slide, please. So um, we've created a number of different hypothesis clusters within the Southern Coastal Systems. They are created with a group of subject matter experts. We do get together small groups of, of individuals that have um, certain expertise um, to, to, to get outside you know, information um, and, and bring in that additional uh, knowledge that, that we need. Um, now, we do, we do have diagrams that go along with these. We use the same formats as, this, as the conceptual ecological models, although because we want them to be a little more um, specific, we, we, we went back to the basic format, that is the non-grouped format. And you'll see when I show you an example that the diagram gets a little messier when you do this. Um, so our topics in the Southern Coastal Systems mostly comes from the effects end of the CEM. Some of them are kind of in the stressors, but most of them are either effects or related to effects. I'm going to show you just one example, the water quality and phytoplankton hypothesis cluster, but I'll note that our other hypothesis clusters um, that we have that are important in our system is the salinity, um, your seagrasses, submerged aquatic vegetation, native vegetation mosaic, which is more related to the, um, the transition zone, the Everglades, the freshwater, the, the marshes, the mangroves, um, the, the upland areas, um, estuary nursery habitat. Um, the, the functioning of the nearshore environment as a nursery habitat is a very important element in the restoration and recover and, and serve, um, providing that restored, those restored areas. And then um, predator prey interactions are also very important. We have to look kind of trophically from bottom to top you know, you, it, when you look at your, your higher organisms, such as your birds, you have to have the prey at the right time um, and in the right place, um, you know, for instance, for nesting, um, to be able to have successful uh, bird. Next, next, next slide. So to go through the example of, um, again, uh, the water quality and phytoplankton hypothesis clusters, we use the same drivers, as I said before, as um, we used in the conceptual ecological models. You'll see the water management, which includes the SERP implementation, land use changes, um, sea level rise, and, and climate change. Again, we did not use a grouped approach as we get down into our stressors in the yellow. Um, you'll see that we have them singled out because we're in a looking at a specific um, area, just the water quality and phytoplankton. So the stressors that we have listed that are important um, for us is the altered flow distribution, the altered groundwater inputs, the altered vol the volume, timing, and quality of the freshwater inflow, 
Uh, residence times and flushing rate changes are, are also important in our shallow coastal systems. Salinity changes and um, temperature increases. Um, and again, you'll note we, we do have the top to bottom um, vertical arrows, but there is some interrelationship and actually quite a bit between the stressors. Um, I used, <laughs> used the term multiple stressors, and I think this is probably applicable to uh, the reef systems as well. There's oftentimes not one stress, but multiple stresses uh, working on them at the same time. And that can affect um, how, what the impacts. You may have a, something that may seem in and of itself a small impact, such as a temperature change, but to a system that's already stressed by other things, such as uh, disease or light, um, it, you know, it, it can have a greater effect. Um, again, these diagrams are simplistic. You're not going to be able to show all of that complexity in the diagrams, but by showing the interrelationships with the arrows, you bring up that idea and then you document it uh, with your, your documentation. Uh, next, next slide, please. So just moving on down to the effects uh, is shown in the green. Um, so your, your specific uh, stressors go into your effects. And we have listed here uh, the altered nutrient inputs, the benthic grazing changes, SAV community changes, sediment uh, stability, light availability changes, phytoplankton bloom, and then e the internal nutrient cycling and bioavailability. Uh, we determined all of these to be um, potential effects of um, caused by stress from water quality and, and phytoplankton. Uh, next slide. So last but not least, again, we get down to the attributes. And you'll see that there is an increased level of detail. Um, in the conceptual ecological models, it showed water quality and phytoplankton as, as one thing. And here, when we get down, we show water qu quality and phytoplankton in the red. But then also, we break that down into the specific components that we feel are important to be monitored. Um, for both. And we called out, you know, you have some of the obvious for water quality um, constituents that you're looking at, you know, your nutrients, your turbidity, et cetera. And for phytoplankton, you're looking at chlorophyll A, perhaps species composition. But we also thought it important to note that recovering ecosystem constituents, such as if you have a seagrass die off that's a, that's a result from um, a, a water quality or a phytoplankton, you know, bloom. Um, you also need to monitor that re um, recovering uh, uh, system um, to find out how long it's taking to recover and some of the dynamics of um, what aids or hinders um, that recovery, as well as some of the physical parameters such as, you know, hypoxia, pH, and, and the like. Uh, next slide. So um, to kind of wrap this up again, I'll just, I've said this before, but I'll just reiterate it. These diagrams, they, they are simplistic, but they illustrate the interactions um, and elements, and hopefully in a way that at least shows the different, uh, the different components that, that are important. Um, you leave the interactions to the supporting text. Um, and we do think it's important to you know, develop some detailed narrative um, that supports this. And this does take time. Um, and it's also an iterative process. You start with developing the diagram um, and then you start to write the narrative more. And we found anyway that you have to go back and maybe make tweaks to your diagram as, as you write, you find that some things are maybe more important than you thought, some things are less important than you thought, some things might, excuse me, be added. Um, so, you know, it's it's important to understand that they it is a, a an iterative process. It's not necessarily you develop one and then you know you develop the other. Um, and also, uh, you know, with with the hypothesis clusters, the, the same same thing. As you're developing your hypothesis clusters and outlining your uncertainties and your hypothesis. Uh, associated with um, each of your your regions, um, it it's you know you may want to go back and and look at your conceptual ecological models and what you've said there. 
um, to make sure that they're consistent and that, you know, oftentimes you find out more information as you dive a little deeper and realize some things that you have to go back and, and, and change. So, um, uh, you know, this brings me to my next point, um, the next slide. So periodic updates um, are, are necessary um, for the, you develop these um, models and hypothesis clusters, um, but, you know, after a certain amount of time, you need to kind of relook at them again and make sure that everything on there is up to date, um, still relevant and, and, um, and necessary. And again, this is, you know, you, you look at uh, teams of people, usually subject matter experts um, to, to help and to aid, um, evaluating your current knowledge um, and then developing your guiding questions for your hypothesis clusters. Um, next next slide, I think I'm about ready to wrap it up. Um, so again, we'll go back to the overall strategy that uh, Stephanie was, was talking about. Um, your updates lead to changes, may, may lead to, I should say, changes in attributes and monitoring, updates potentially to performance measures, and potentially um, and ultimately developing new tools that can enhance the ability um, of your programs uh, and projects to restore and sustain the, the, color, the Southern coastal systems. Next slide. I think that's it. Um, I just wanna thank you. We've left our contact information. Um, as was mentioned, Stephanie and I are both um, regional coordinators on the Southern coastal systems, um, as well as uh, Carlos Coronado uh, is also a regional coordin coordination. Um, and, you know, I hope this has been helpful. We've tried to give you a little bit of an overview. You obviously have to um, frame your program and what's appropriate to, to your, your system, but we remain available if you just have any questions or, you know, as I said, we, we've been at this for a couple of years now in the updates. So we do have some experiences lessons learned perhaps, um, things we might do better or easier if, if you know, we had known. Um, and so we remain, you know, we'd be more than happy to um, help out in, in any way we can. You can um, contact us with, our, with the information. So thank you. Thank you, Melody, and thank you, Stephanie. Any questions on, uh, on the presentation that we just received? CJ? Yeah, thanks, Wes, and I appreciate that presentation. That was very uh, insightful. Um, I have a question. Maybe we can flip back to slide 15 on the Biscayne Bay CEM, if possible. Um, basically, like, so everything that you've got kind of listed in here is kind of the flow chart that I was more or less thinking about, but I kind of view this as what I was thinking as pie in the sky type data. Uh, let's see when we get to it. Maybe you can. Okay, it was the Southern Coastal Systems Biscayne Bay CEM was the slide I'm looking for. Yep, keep doing, yep, and one more. There we go, okay. So, what I'm wondering here is I'm kind of trying to think a little bit downstream since I'm involved in fisheries management and whatnot. So I'm kind of thinking of how we measure the effects a little bit later on. So you've got nearly every component of the ecosystem more or less in there. But my the part that I have really struggled with in conceptualizing this is the amount of data and monitoring that would be required to measure some of these effects. So I guess my overall question to you both is, do you all, have you all set up some sort of monitoring program? And I'm just curious, like capacity, how many agencies are involved in that kind of work? Just kind of broader context, if you will, just a little, little curious about how this is actually implemented on that level. Many agencies to be, you know, it's SERP, I don't know how familiar you are with, but just about every agency, uh, you know, you can think of. 
um, is involved. And, and yes, Recover does rely heavily on um, interagency you know, work and, and coordinating the, the different efforts. Um, one of the, the, and something you said, I'll, it touched, uh, you, you can't monitor every single thing. You do have to prioritize. And part of uh, the hypothesis clusters um, where you're actually developing, you, you, you're drilling that down a little bit um, and trying to get to some of those priorities. Um, you're looking at what are your main hypotheses that are driving, you're listing those out and you don't see that in the diagram, that's the text behind the diagram. And you're listing out your main uncertainties um, as well. Um, and again, and maybe uh, Stephanie or Gina can, can talk to this a, a little bit more, these are linked to um, our map, which is our monitoring assessment plan in Recover, as well as the adaptive um, management plan. And these are also undergoing updates you know, at present, which is why we did the updates to the CEMs and the hypothesis clusters first, because they help inform and, and can help prioritize and guide um, you know, what your actual monitoring is gonna be and where. Um, you know, it, it, in some areas, it's more important to do certain types of monitoring in other areas, it's important to do other types of monitoring. It, 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 there is some area specificity there as well. Um, and I don't know if Stephanie or, and Gina, if you had anything you wanted to add. Sure, I can add a little bit to that. Um, so as you can see, there's one, two, three, four, five, uh, seven little uh, bottom uh, attributes listed. And we don't, we don't monitor everything. Um, we would, you know, in a pie in the sky, yeah, we could monitor it. Um, but uh, like Melody said, you know, focusing on our uncertainties and our hypotheses, like what don't we know regarding um, some of these different attributes? Um, and our our map, um, the monitoring and assessment plan, uh, we do try to incorporate as as much as we can. Um, the map was initially developed in 2009 um, and it has, uh, you know, it, it's it served a good purpose and we've covered a lot of information um, and we, we would like to be able to uh, continue monitoring and expand the monitoring that is incorporated in the map. And one of our recover workshops that we held um, this past summer, uh, we was for taking an inventory and, and a number of you on the call were, were involved in um, gathering information um, from the from your respective agencies to try to uh, showcase what you're doing and, and seeing where there might be spatial gaps or temporal gaps um, that when Recover, if Recover can fill some of those voids or some of those um, areas that we aren't monitoring as um, uh, robustly as possible, uh, we can try to focus on on areas that that we we are missing. Um, so if that helps as well, I mean, we would like to be able to you know cover you know phytoplankton composition and biomass. We you know we don't have um, for the southern coastal systems. We, you know we don't have that capability at the time, but it is a valuable attribute and you know, not just important for uh, the different you know food chains, but also for um, the seagrasses, you know, they're connected to um, algal blooms and water quality. So there's a lot of interconnected um, attributes um, between our different hypothesis clusters. And so if we can focus on some of the main, um, the main attributes that can answer as many uncertainties or, or you know, fit within um, our hypothesis clusters as we can, that, that's our goal. Dr. Ralph, did you want to yep. add to that? Wes, thank you. I just want to add that one of the, the key components of Recover's monitoring and assessment plan, not just the uncertainties, but how can SERP affect that attribute? And as you know, we all want to monitor everything, but if SERP cannot have a discernible effect, um, it's it's not high on the priority list to monitor. So that's just something to, to keep in mind um, as you all are, are coming up with your 
framework and your identification for indicators. Thank you all, that was helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you'll find those threads interspersed through the framework um, if, if you go back and read it too. So it, we, it sounds like we're on the right track. Derek, you've had your hand raised, I'm sorry. Hey, Derek Cox with South Florida Water Management District. And, and I promise I'm not just sitting in a dark room even though it looks that way. Um, could we go forward a few slides? I think it was the water quality and phytoplankton uh, CEM hypothesis cluster, maybe it was. I think it's 20 was the, yeah, thank you. Uh, so just looking at this and trying to kind of frame it, you know, in, in, as it relates to this group um, and then not to be negative here, but trying to kind of frame the challenge maybe of what at least my understanding of the, the at least one charge of this group is, is to basically draw a line from that top left box down to one of the attributes and saying that, you know, this bit of Everglades restoration water management CERP component is causing this attribute change, this change in an attribute. And, you know, this is a, looks complicated, but we're, we're only at the, the base of the food chain here or physical <laughs> parameters with this. We're not even getting into other trophic levels. And, you know, you could draw 60 different lines through this chart here. Granted, there's no this is just, you know, uh, qualitative rather than quantitative, but it's that's going to be, I think, the biggest challenge moving forward with all of this is making those direct connections between things that we can measure out there, excuse me, um, and these actual, you know, Everglades restoration things that we're, these projects that we're doing. And so I was just looking at this and trying to figure out, you know, how to maybe simplify it. I know we're going to be working on some of these um, CEMs and hypothesis clusters for uh, floors uh, coral reef, but just trying to wrap my head around that and and kind of throw it out for any thoughts or discussions that could maybe help help simplify this task or or, or make things a little more man more manageable at least for for me to understand you know, like the feasibility moving forward with this. I'll I'll just offer first and foremost, um, you know, we have Chris Kelbel coming on next to talk about. Um, a conceptual ecological model that he put together um, a while back on Florida's coral reef. So um, we're not certain from scratch. That's certainly certainly first. Um, and I think secondly, um, we're we're going to be borrowing a lot, specifically from the Southern Coastal Systems um, module as well. And, and sort of, um, I mean, from my perspective, part of the task is just looking to integrate the two and validate. Um, the two for current conditions as this team sees them. So I'm hoping um, that it's, uh, you know, again, uh, to quote Dana earlier, you know, not not starting from scratch um, and that, you know, this group, again, really is more um, kind of compiling the work that's already been done and and sort of evaluating it and, and pushing it forward um, to identify kind of next steps for, um, you know, new work to refine these things. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, th this is, it's a complicated system. Um, and, uh, it, it, it deserves a thorough look, um, to make sure we're, uh, you know, getting, getting a good sense of, of what's going on and, and that, you know, the measures that we're actually attributing to certain, uh, stressors or drivers or, or actually, you know, what's happening. Uh, it, it gets very complicated very quickly. Yeah. And, and I'll just add, you, you do have to look at that um, time scale um, factor again and magnitude. Not, not all of the stressors, not all of the drivers are equal at any given time. Um, one of the suggestions that I've, I've thought of and, and, you know, you've hit the nail on the head. It is it is hard to drill down to any specific parameter and, and try to go back up and say, okay, what's the main effect? What's the main stressor? Um, one, one of the things, and this is just a suggestion that I would throw out there, is that um, you pick one or two of your main stressors and just, you know, take out the other ones for now. I mean, you can do the bigger diagram, but then drill down to a more even focused diagram and um, get to um, you know, some of that, that drill down 
what are those those attributes, those parameters you might want to monitor from that way. You know, pick pick your one or two uh, stressors that you feel are the most important or that are have the most effect. Um, and it may take you one or two iterations of a diagram like this um, and some background <laughs> and some subject matter expert, you know, discussion to get to that. But um, I think it could be done and I think you could get to a, a simpler level um, with, with a little bit of extra extra push. There. Yeah, and those actually were my thoughts as well as I was trying to, you know, roll this around in my head is, you know, getting that magnitude, you know, getting that as direct of a relationship as we can. Obviously, it's still going to be complex, but getting kind of as direct a relationship as we can between, uh, you know, restoration work and the attribute that we're, we're looking at. Um, but then also getting a time scale that's that's reasonable for seeing changes that we can attribute to to restoration. Um, and so just something to be kind of, I guess, keeping in our heads as we're moving forward with with developing some of these and working on some of these action items. Um, but, but more to I was, we'll discuss that more later, I'm sure. Just kind of wanted to throw it out there for food for thought. No, I I think it's a, a great point. And and I think, you know between the discussion between you and Melody, especially like I could see us developing a more complete diagram like this, but just focusing on, you know, a single pathway or a couple of relationships, like specifically within that um, to, to target if, if the evidence points to that being where our focus should be, right? So um, yeah, I think that'll come with time as we, we keep working through this. You know, Wes, you're on another interesting point there on those simplified versions of the diagrams laid out. And you look at the things you can actually measure and start to do, you know, some attribution. And there's a whole area of work that can still still needs to be done. We're involved in it some here at, at the SFNRC uh, to differentiate between that in that signal, there's a fraction of that signal that's being driven by a number of other different drivers, including natural drivers. And there's a fraction of it that you can attribute back to the water management action, or you can attribute back to when you change the water, uh, change the plan, or when you build a different feature on the landscape. And differentiating between those is, it's subtle science. It's tricky. Um, but we can, you know, it'd be worth looking at it. We we think it's worth looking at it and we're looking at it ourselves. But in this particular case, we might run into several, many places where this type of work needs to be done. So interesting. I, I'm I'm betting it'll just be one simple straight shot. Absolutely. Straight down. <laughs> <laughs> Every time. <laughs> any uh, any other comments, questions for Stephanie or Melody? All right, great. Thank you both very much. And uh, we might we might call you back at some point next year. So stay by the phone. <laughs> that was excellent. Thank you. And we'll just uh, keep moving right along to our next agenda item. Um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Chris Kelbel um, from NOAA's AOML lab on uh, Virginia Key. Um, Many of you hopefully should know Chris uh, from his work on the Science Coordination Group as the uh, AOML representative there. Um, he's also the Director of the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystems Division of AOML and is a Principal Investigator for Ecosystem Assessment um, and Modeling Laboratory within the Ocean Chemistry and Ecosystems Division there at AOML. Um, Chris, thanks so much for taking some time to talk about your your previous work um, here, and uh, we're I think we're all excited to to see what you've got for us. Thank you, Wes, and uh, I'm glad I caught a little bit of discussion before this because it's very relevant and, and helps me to to frame where I'm going here. Because um, one of the things I'm going to be talking today about the Marine and Estuary Marine and Ecosystem Goal Setting Program, and this is a program we had done in South Florida over a decade ago. Um, uh, can you move to the next slide, please? So I think one of the things with conceptual models is that they're always built for the purpose that they're going to be used for, and different models work for different purposes. And what we were trying to do in this Marius program was um, a pretty grand purpose, which was to reach a science-based consensus about the defining ca characteristics and fundamental processes of a South Florida coastal marine ecosystem that is sustainable 
and capable of providing the, the diverse ecosystem services upon which our society depends. So basically wrapping up kind of sustainability and the blue economy into, into one goal there and saying, we're gonna say what that, what that looks like. Um, and the first thing I would say is it took a bunch, a bunch of people. There was over a hundred participants and there was over 40 different co-authors on the various papers and reports that we put out. And the whole goal was to get to consensus, not agreement necessarily, but consensus. So we did this in a couple of different ways. Some of them I'm gonna share with you because they might be useful as you move forward. Uh, one of which is the conceptual diagrams. The other is um, integrated conceptual ecosystem models. So we kind of put an eye in front of our conceptual ecosystem models, mostly because this project was unique in that it was one of the first ones um, almost anywhere that incorporated social scientists with what we classically term natural sciences. So for the first time we had economists and sociologists and uh, all those types of folks sitting with us in the same room and trying to determine what makes it, it makes it sustainable and productive ecosystem. So that also led us to developing indices. So instead of having a single indicator, the idea was you could have an indice. So you could have an indice of water quality that might inc incorporate nutrients as well as chlorophyll in this case. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some risk and trade-off analysis that you can do with these conceptual models. I'm not sure um, if that's of interest to the group, but, it, but it's kind of um, a neat place that you can take these. And um, kind of what you saw, part of what Mares did was took the existing kind of the existing SERP ecosystems and said, let's move more into the marine realm. So we, we really focused on the Southeast Florida shelf, the Florida Keys and Dry Tortugas and the Southwest Florida shelf, which at, the, at that point were really kind of considered almost outside of SERP. They've become more part of it now as this group can attest to. Uh, next slide. So one of the first things we did, as I mentioned, doing these integrated conceptual models we kind of started out looking at a pressure state response model, which is the classic EPA model that derived and developed into a driver pressure state impact response model, which is uh, kind of the classic one that was used in the early aughts and late 90s. However, when we sat there and talked about this type of model with social science colleagues there, it just didn't work. Impacts was a word that meant different things to the different disciplines. And as I mentioned, one of our goals was, what does the ecosystem look like if it's providing the services to society that we want? So what we did was replace that impacts with ecosystem services. And you'll see throughout, this is a theme, we really tried to put people into the ecosystem, which I think is critical when you talk about, especially our coral reefs. Anytime you're out on the coral reefs, you can pretty much look and see giant human habitation on land. So, so we have to, not just pretend it's not there, we have to make sure we're incorporating that and including it both in the positive and negative ways in which it affects the ecosystem. So that's kind of our first step was with the conceptual model was just to modify it, put ecosystem services on there. I'm gonna walk through some examples of how we did this and also some other things we did, which was um, starting with drawing out the ecosystem. So getting not just a consensus based on words and, and kind of the classic conceptual models, but starting with a consensus of what the ecosystem is. Um, so next slide, please. And, and the way we did this, um, you can see right here, is we basically just stood in front of a whiteboard. We were all in the room and we said, here's what the ecosystem looks like. So this is for the Southeast uh, Florida shelf. And you can see you have anchorages there, you have an inlet, you have the three uh, reef tracks going out as you go offshore, you have the intercoastal waterway, and we started out drawing this kind of on the board. We drew it in plain view in the cross section. And then we took it, uh, mostly it was done by Pamela Fletcher, who's a, another co-PI on this project. She took these drawings and turned them into beautiful uh, computer graphics. At, and the next slide will show you that. So this is that same thing of showing what's going on in the whole ecosystem so that we had an agreement of like this, this is the ecosystem. It's not a particular location in the ecosystem, so it's kind of generalized. So don't think of it as Port Everglades or, or whatever particular area you're, you're, you're thinking about. Think of it as kind of a way to generalize the whole ecosystem. So you can see we already are starting to see some of the land-based uh, pressures here, like sewage treatment, shipping, agricultural areas, some of the natural ecosystem components like the reef tracks, as well as dredge channels, jetties, things of that nature. Um, 
And then in addition to doing this, because you can only see, see so much when you're looking down like in this satellite type of view, we did a cross section. Uh, so the next slide, please. So we did this type of cross section where you're kind of going from the most land-based on your left offshore. And this is showing you the various different things. And this is really trying to get all of the pressures, states, uh, and even ecosystem services in one thing. So you can see there's things like head boats and, and divers and spear, spear fishermen and recreational things. We try, really tried to like, there's a lot here, but we really tried to incorporate all the uses, all of the ecosystem components, all the pressures into one diagram. One of the other things we did kind of feeding off that discussion that was just being had is, as we all know, you, we're trying to determine what Everglades restoration is doing, but Everglades restoration is taking place amongst this backdrop of other pressures that we have going on in the system and backdrop of other drivers like climate change and, and the need to, to harvest food and grow food and, and all those other things. So um, you can't view it just in isolation of that. So you can see here, one of the things we did in these graphics is look at, there's far field pressures that are coming in, like changing atmospheric chemistry that's causing ocean acidification, changing temperatures. But what we really tried to show along the bottom of this graphic I thought was really neat was showing the distribution of pressures within the system. So like where is fishing and harvesting taking place? Where do we see the most groundings and anchorings? Where's tourism, you know, kind of getting that kind of localized within the diagram where are the pressures happening? So once we had those diagrams, we created the conceptual model that you see on the left here. And it's, it's one of the interesting things we did too, was we had resource managers as part of the groups. And one of the things they said is, we don't manage for, for any of the states or the pressures. We managed to control those things, but what we're really managing for and what we hear from the stakeholders is how ecosystem services are changing. So that's why you see ecosystem services at the top here. Um, so this is just showing you what that model looks like we then took all of those state boxes and blew them up into bigger models. And, and I'll show you some of those for the coral reefs so that we understand how the individual state models are happening. And that also allows us to make the connections because we couldn't have all these components and start drawing the connections. It would just be a nasty diagram of like thousands of connections. Um, so this model is the example for the Southeast Florida coast going out to the coral reefs. Uh, next slide, please. And what we'll see here, this is the one for the Florida Keys. So we kind of drew separate models for separate areas. Obviously, the Florida Keys is very different than the Southeast Florida coast. We had the island change kind of going down the middle here through the cross section. Similar type of layout with, with various far field inferences, influences. Um, what kind of is of, of use here is what you see on the very left of this picture are Gulf of Mexico influences. I think they could also be sort of considered um, the uh, Everglades influences, so you see nutrients coming in, recruits coming in, and runoff coming in, and that's kind of a bit of where the Everglades is going to happen. Um, <clears throat> again, trying to show those pressures across and trying to get the different uh, things that are happening on the ecosystem. We also try to here highlight the different habitat types because they vary quite a lot as you go across the geography of the Keys. And again, on the left is, is kind of our, our word version of this model and you can see responses meaning the management thing so this group i know is ultra flows based on everglades restoration but just like that's happening against a backdrop of pressures everglades management is happening against the backdrop of all these other management entities that are coordinating with one another but it doesn't mean that any of their impacts and, and responses are mutually exclusive of one another so we need to be considering all of those um, <clears throat> so that's kind of in a nutshell, what we did as far as the conceptual models happen at the highest level. Now I wanna show you what it looked like when we kind of drilled in and started looking at the individual ones. So if you go to the next slide, I'm showing you what the two coral models you look like. On the left is the Southeast Florida coast, on the white right is the Florida Keys. They look very similar. There's some differences in the attributes that we measure. Um, what we did do with this, instead of ending with those attributes that we measure, which is sort of where like the, the, the recover models and we took it and added attributes that people care about. So these are the things that kind of are the bridge from the condition of the ecosystem and the ecosystem services being provided. So these are the things that, that most likely the stakeholders are gonna care about, like healthy coral, lots and a large variety of fish, 
protection from storms and erosion. I mean, we've all heard of corals providing the, the protection from hurricanes, critical habitat for protected species, ecosystem resilience to disturbance. So we want to add those in um, and make this a real big focus of, of the model as well, because that's, that's the way we connect to ecosystem services. And these are the things that, that people care about getting out of the ecosystem and care about when they go and, and experience the system. Uh, below that, that is the attributes we measure. That's where probably the most diversity is because we were measuring different things and different components of the ecosystem. I don't know if that still is the case because this was a decade ago. And then um, below those attributes are the pressures and the drivers. So a lot of the pressures are, are I mean, a lot of the changes are related to, to the water columns in there, which is our version of water quality. So is fish and selfish, macroalgae, which is, you know, part of water quality, but so important for the corals that we wanted to call it out here, and then changes in coral growth and mortality, and then in, in kind of yellow are the, uh, are the pressures affecting all of these things. Um, and luckily, we, we even had disease on there back in 2012. That'd probably be a bigger bigger circle now, unfortunately, but, um, but we were thinking about those things. So, um, so that's kind of what we did. And, and part of a large part of why we did this and created those conceptual models was then to start and think about what are the indicators, in this case, we call them indices, but what are the things we need to measure to be able to keep track of the system and see if we are heading towards what our goals are. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'm showing here is, is a great website. I encourage everybody go to, to go to the sanctuarywatch.ius. This is specifically for sanctuaries in the US. Um, this is the Florida Keys representative here. And you can see it looks similar to kind of that conceptual uh, diagram I showed, we've modified it a little bit. What's shown with everything with a circle here is one of our indicators. And what you can do on the website is click on these circles and it'll pull up a time series of that indicator. So you can see how that indicator is changing over time and space. Um, and this is something that, that we did and it really struck home with, with folks like the uh, Sanctuary Advisory Committee that they, they, they really like this product as a way to kind of communicate. So I think as you as you move forward and think about what indicators you have as far as water quality, Everglades effects on reefs, it's also important to think about how you're going to communicate those changes because um, that that's a big part of it is to make sure people understand what you're trying what you're trying to say and not just the scientists in the room, but but make sure your stakeholders do as well. Um, and if you go to this website, you can see we've been developing these for different sanctuaries uh, throughout the U.S. and and trying to take this similar type of approach. Um, next slide. And then just wanted to show some other things we were able to do. So with these conceptual models, we had linkages going all the way from pressures to states to ecosystem services. And we then, um, with everybody that was involved in MARES, actually scored these pressures based on the relative intensity of them against one another. So the linkages from pressure to state and the linkages from state to ecosystem services. And we could then do some matrix math and determine which pressures were having the greatest impact on ecosystem services. So the ones at the bottom, and this was for uh, essentially the whole South Florida coastal uh, and marine ecosystem. But you see the ones on the bottom, freshwater delivery was actually the, the pressure that had the biggest direct impact on ecosystem services, which is a good one thing because that's something we have control over. Um, whereas most of the next most important pressures, most next most impactful pressures, I should say, are all climate change related, which are things we can't really control too much. Um, so really that freshwater delivery might be, is, is likely our key lever to, to include services. And it's also, with this one, this was a, a first blush, we, we did not weight the importance of ecosystem services. So we assumed every ecosystem service was equally important and just work through the math that way. Um, next slide. So in addition to looking at impacts on uh, and doing that kind of what we call a risk analysis, looking at how the pressures are impacting the services, we also have done these scenario analysis. So this is actually a, a different model that we used up in Louisiana. What you're seeing at the top is fish, so the amount of fish in, in the ecosystem. HL actually stands for habitable land because this was done for the river diversions in Mississippi. Uh, next is recreation, so that's like recreational um, kind of tourism and recreational fishing. And then the bottom one is, is wetlands. And what we have here are different scenarios where we're looking at if you increased fishing, if you um, incorporated uh, a warming, I think we did about 
two degrees Celsius. And then if you did fishing and warming together, how does it perturb the whole system so that you're affecting these specific ecosystem services? And um, it's just a nice, easy way. We did it with three different methods to look and see, are they consistent? Which thankfully they were in a lot of the cases. So we can see what where, where changes in these different kind of management scenarios or changes in the environment are gonna change the delivery of ecosystem services. Uh, next slide, please. The other thing I want to discuss is since Marius was a decade ago, this EBM, we call this the EBM Dipser model where we put ecosystem services in. It has evolved even more since then. There's now a few different varieties of models. I want to highlight two others that, that have kind of been used. Um, and again, as I mentioned in the beginning, it kind of depends on what your project goals are, what you're trying to do, which one might be appropriate. So like we're using this model here, which is the DPSCR4 in a project that we're doing for uh, Deepwater Horizon restoration because it has a big focus on the responses box and the restoration box is a big part there, obviously. So, so we're using this one. Um, it's very similar to the one we created, except for the ecosystems and human well-being part are now in what they call condition, which is similar to the state and the responses are afterwards. Uh, and they kind of parsed what we were terming pressures into pressures and stressors, which is again, a little bit of semantics thing. Um, so there's th this, this model and then uh, next slide. There's also what's called the Dapsy worm, which is another uh, similar type of model. Instead of impacts on ecosystem services, they do impacts on human welfare. And then responses are measures, which means management measures, which are specific management actions that can be taken to change the system in a very specific way. Um, this is a European model, and that's kind of the European management speak, but management measures would be things like increasing the flow out of Shark River by 10% would be a management measure. Um, so I just wanted to highlight those, those couple of, of, of other models there are just so that you kind of got an idea of the whole kind of um, a, a kind of menu of different, different conceptual models. I, I have whole presentations on this if you want to learn more about it too. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, I just wanted to kind of talk to you real quickly. We, we've done these conceptual models. I'm a big believer that we need conceptual models that include humans. We, we, Building them without humans is something we used to do. It's something we shouldn't be doing anymore. Um, ideally, especially if you're going to communicate with a broader audience beyond scientists, they should be graphical in some way so that you can communicate in, in an easier manner. Um, we found that replacing impacts with ecosystem service was critical for us to uh, integrate with social sciences. And um, as I kind of alluded to at the end, it's important to note this is a snapshot in time. This was a decade ago. If we were to do this project again, we'd probably do it a little bit differently and things have evolved since then. But even these older models are useful to select indicators, conduct risk assessments, and do those evaluate management scenarios. So kind of to Wes's point, there's a lot out there. You get you all should definitely not be starting from square one. We should, you know, we should build upon this. Um, and learn from it. I mentioned in the chat when you're talking about indicators of what controls Everglades restoration. We're already using chlorophyll A in Florida Bay, Biscayne Bay, some areas of the Southwest Florida Shelf. It makes sense to extend that out into the areas where you're working about where we're not really covering. There's also other things we could do better. Like we probably, chlorophyll A by itself is probably not sufficient. We probably need nutrients. We probably need transects going along the coastline so you can tell what is um, and is not coming from the Everglades and what's being produced locally. Because as you kind of saw those conceptual diagrams, there's the Everglades influences coming in, but there's a lot of things happening within these ecosystems right on the coastline before the water gets out onto the, onto the corals. I mean, you're talking about things like septic tanks as well as, as sewage treatment centers, as well as agriculture. Um, next slide, please. I just wanted to show you some resources so you have these when you look at the slide later. The big one is that first one, which is a link to the website for uh, the NCOS page. NCOS had funded this, uh, which is part of NOAA, NOAA's National Ocean Service. And that has links to all the, all the papers and, and kind of documents produced by MARES. And uh, next slide, because with that, I think I'm done and I'll take any questions that, that folks might have.
Any questions for Chris? Eric? Oh, I just start with thank you, Chris. Appreciate it. You know, we spent a lot of effort. Uh, I was one of the hundred plus people that came to provide opinion and, uh, um, you know, basically set through an onslaught of questions trying to do it. Um, looking at the presentation today, you pulled out a couple of them on coral and coral hard bottom communities, and you pulled up on chlorophyll A. And when we look at the presentations that went just before it, I, I kind of, I wonder, and I kind of throw it out to the team uh, for not recreating the wheel, but actually doing some sort of crosswalk between the hypothesis clusters, clusters and performance measures that we're thinking about on the restoration side and thinking about these you know, dips or variety models that and the outcomes that they have on the on the coral side of it. I'm I'm wondering if that might be a worthy exercise, possibly something we could put into the workshop format if we're thinking about what our next steps are, just as a, a concept. Chris, any thoughts on that? I guess I'm looking for guidance on good brass tacks place to just start. <laughs> yeah, I think that's that's a really good place to start. Is it as Eric mentioned, it, it, I just gave you a, a quick snapshot. I was actually <laughs> going back in my mind, remembering everything we did, and it was quite a lot. That it, it would be it would be a shame not not to use this. Plus, I know a whole ton of equal amount of efforts gone into those hypothesis clusters. And I think it is it is a crosswalking. I showed you the coral models. We also have water quality models that I'd be happy to share with you. Um, I think we all sort of, yeah, I think it's all there already. It's just a matter of kind of reformatting it for, for the needs of this group is what I would say. And, and I think, I do think though, there is some thought that needs to go into indicators and, and what makes sense to answer specific questions. Cause like I said, I think, I think we're doing okay with what we have, but we're also, I feel like I know there's places where we could do better on water quality and, and we aren't because of, you know, a number of different issues. Excellent. Yo. Yeah, Chris, thanks for that presentation. Um, we certainly aren't starting from scratch and we appreciate all the work that's been done. Um, but what occurs to me is, you know, if we assume that there is something in the environment that has happened involving who knows how many different parameters that we may not measure or be aware of that is creating a situation less conducive to the, uh, the long-term health of our coral reef. Um, and if you think about how coral reefs form and, and uh, have evolved over time, the first word that comes to my mind is um, stasis or, or near stasis. Um, so if you think about all of these potential uh, parameters that we might measure and use as uh, indicators having some sort of band that is defined as being appropriate. That's one thing, but when, the, when these indicators start interacting, that collective band may get narrower and narrower. Um, so I think what was said earlier, the, the only practical path forward seems to pick, seems to be to pick a few parameters or indicators that are easily measured and have a somewhat unambiguous connection to coral health and begin there and perhaps focus a little bit more on the interaction of these parameters and the ultimate effect. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile to do that, Gil, because I, I do agree. I think, I mean, even with a couple indicators, like I was mentioning, chlorophyll A being used, if we just expanded it, we still don't, it doesn't definitively say this is elevated because of Everglades restoration, or this is elevated because of the halo effect around the keys or, or septic tanks in, you know, some of the ordering counties. So I do think um, whatever indicators are being considered, you do need to kind of almost develop a conceptual model of that indicator going across the system of, of how it's going to change and what those things might be. And also, 
think about ways to minimize or, or determine relative influences because there's there's not good if there is I wish there were but there is no silver bullet that you can measure and say this is this tells you how how everybody's restoration is impacting the health of the reefs that's going to end up being a few of them and then trying to tease apart the impacts of different different processes any other hands Joanna. Thanks, Wes. Hey, Chris. Thank you so much for <laughs> digging deep on this one because I was also one of those hundred and something participants back a decade ago. And I I will I will say you were you guys were ahead of your time. <laughs> <laughs> we're really glad that this exists now. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure then how it was going to be used, but it, I, I, I think I was very early on in my management career at that point. Uh, anyway, point is, uh, in your um, slide with the Cook et al. Uh, results um, that showed that freshwater delivery had a, a really large impact on uh, ecosystem services, do you know enough about that paper to talk a little bit more about that particular uh, impact, like what 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 ecosystem services were impacted, or is that something that we need to just do follow up on? I would prefer follow up. I used to know enough about that paper. <laughs> no I don't want to pretend because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that I, I know we have a have a graph that shows exactly what ecosystem services were impacted by freshwater delivery, but I can't quote it. No worries. Free. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I, I'm putting you on the hook officially for homework on that, please, because I would very much like to understand that a little bit better. Um, uh, it, it, it is reminding me of some more recent uh, stony coral tissue loss disease response data from Dr. Brian Walker here at Nova Southeastern University that is um, showing that there is a linkage in Miami-Dade and Broward County between um, large scale rain events, large scale water management discharges, and increased coral disease, um, both lesions and severity of the lesions on the corals that he's been tracking for multiple years. Um, and so again, that does not mean it's the Everglades projects or the, the, the water that is from the Everglades, or maybe it's the urban water that's being pushed out. We don't know, but I would like to know what has been done and just maybe start teasing apart some of that yeah, I'd be happy to share that with you. It, I just got to dig in and find that graph and, and send it to you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Great. Well, Chris, I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you. And uh, we'll be looking to engage with you further, I think, on, on this topic for sure. Appreciate your help. Thank you. It's all good. All right, at this point, uh, let me see where we are on the agenda. Uh, we are ready for public comment. Um, so Alan and Marsha, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, terrific. Thanks, um, Wes. <clears throat> um, anyone, we open it up now to public comment. So anyone who um, from the attendees who would like to make some comments, please raise your hands and we will be calling on you one by one um, and unmuting your your um, phone at that time. And one second, I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty here. One second, here we go. All right, so I'm looking at the attendees list and anybody who would like to speak, please go ahead and raise your hand now. I'm not seeing any hands as of now, Wes and Eric. I just want to confirm that that actual function is working right for us. So if one of you in the attendee mode could give us a raised hand just to be sure that that function was working properly, I would feel more comfortable. Thank you, Laura. Okay, great. Maybe Karen. Oh, very good. Thank you, oh, Melody. Melody. Appreciate it. Stop. Appreciate that. Yeah. All righty. Then we're good. All right. Great. Thank you all for being with us. Um, 
we'll look to close it out. Um, again, want to thank everybody for their participation um, and for the thoughtful discussion that occurred on several of our agenda items. Um, myself and Eric and Alan will be working on uh, scheduling our, our meetings for next year. Um, I think it it worked pretty well this this past year to kind of piggyback on the working group and science coordination group meetings, even if for the the handful of us who who had to uh, had to endure all of them um, together. Uh, but uh, so just we'll we'll sort of look to do that again. I think the um, OERI team are trying to finalize those dates now. Um, we're looking at one um, as early as mid-January, um, so stay tuned um, for that. Uh, our charter requires that we meet quarterly, so it is possible that we could skip um, that January meeting and just jump right into uh, the March timeframe when the second joint working group science coordination group meeting will, will happen. Um, so I think as we look to develop the schedule for what we hope to achieve as a team, um, online, um, we can sort of figure out whether a January meeting makes sense or or kind of push to March. Um, but then, so we're looking at mid-January, mid-March, mid-July, late September, and early December um, as sort of the, the time points right now, just to keep in mind. Um, so we will uh, we'll keep you informed on that as, as much as possible. And I assume, um, you know, if we can find some other experiential learning opportunities in that time frame, um, we will work with our local partners to help identify um, some uh, some some sites possibly for visits. Um, and and I will request that we do those in in the late summer, early fall time frame, uh, because uh, you know no no need to get hypothermia. Um, which I get when water temperatures are under 80 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, true, true Miami native that I am. Um, outside of that, um, I'll just say, you know, again, kind of circling back on kind of the, the notion of our work going forward, um, just so it's in the record. Um, I think that we'll, um, we'll work on looking at a, timeline for finalizing those first two action plans, the um, water quality and biological or ecological monitoring inventories that we've got substantial work done on already. Um, we'll look at some options for what um, workshopping and engagement might look like surrounding answering those questions from action three. Um, we'll also think about a rough outline for addressing um, the plans for actions four through six, um, which is what we spent a lot of the time kind of introducing today. Um, and I and I do think um, identifying Im involvement opportunities with the PDT or the sub team meetings um, for BBC or specifically, but to Laura's point, other projects as well, um, may be something where, um, again, if we if we have folks who are already engaged in those, events, um, maybe we can build in some some feedback mechanisms into our meetings um, to ensure that everybody's keeping pace with uh, with those uh, projects as they develop. And as we get our footing in terms of um, what what the group believes, um, you know, those projects might bring to the table for for the reef and from our perspective as the FCRCT. Um, Eric, Alan, any additional final remarks before we end here? I just have um, a, a <clears throat> logistical information regarding the next few meetings. I got some feedback for the members that I will attempt to send out calendar invites to hold on your schedule to make sure it doesn't get lost in the fray. But just please be aware that your actual link to any future meetings, because we use Zoom for the ones that are virtual, or if you're 
um, attending one of the hybrid meetings in a virtual fashion, that Zoom link will always come separately through Zoom. So going forward, I'll try to book your calendar up as soon as we have some dates, but just that Zoom part is also very important um, to actually participate as a panelist and have access to all the, the Zoom information that way. Um, also, we'll let you know, besides our meetings, when the task force itself will be meeting in Florida, possibly in April, and we'll let you know about that in case you're interested in attending or watching. And that is all I have. Great. And and to that point too, Alan, uh, when we when we start getting those uh, those dates set on the working group and science coordination group meetings, maybe we can do a poll of folks to find out what dates are most advantageous for an in-person meeting or two during the year. So we can try to get everybody coordinated on that as well. Um, and and again, obviously, I think the summer and good. Fall meetings are the are the ones because of field trip opportunities. But um, that would be great to to have as many folks as possible be in person. Eric, anything? No, just to thank you to the speakers today that came and shared what they did. I think that's really very helpful for us as we're getting into that step. So it just slots in right on with what we had in mind for where we're going over the next well this this calendar this fiscal year. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a, there's a ton of work that's already been done in this space. And uh, the value add from this team is to bring it all together um, and integrate it with with the broader Everglades stuff. So um, I think I think there's there's good work to be done here um, and we'll just keep carrying on. Thank you all very much. Happy holidays um, and, and hope everyone has a, a good new year entering 2024. And a quick thank you to all my colleagues that are off screen, but behind the scenes making this all run smoothly. If you saw my eyes darting around, we had a couple of technical things I was dealing with on the side, but thanks to Jose, Marcia, and Carrie for being behind the scenes and supporting us. And no one noticed because of how good y'all are. Thank you. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Fantastic. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank Have a good you. day.